All righty, everybody. How are we doing tonight? Live show today. And as you can see, we replaced Tony with someone much, much better. <laughs> we got the one, the only Herman Lutman. As hey, everybody. And I love Tony. Don't speak disparagingly about him. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Oh, you know what? I was supposed to actually send him a link to the show in case he could join. Actually, I probably should do that. Um, he was going to be out, but he wasn't sure if he'd be able to make it or not. So anyways, wow, busy episode. And of course, lots to talk about this week. How is everyone doing out there? Thank you all for coming on out to the show. Whew. Ruff, Herman, what's been going on then? Go uh, on, you go first. You want me to go first? Yeah, go on, you're the guest. Well, I, I am wearing my, in honor, uh, in memory of Dusty Hill from ZZ Top, who just passed yeah. away. I'm wearing my ZZ Top shirt for you rock and roll fans out there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Kevin actually uh, messaged me on Facebook today because some comments were made about uh, the devils to pay, so I had to answer over there. And thank you, Kev. Chris is here. Hey. Chris, Steven. Wow, Hello. look at everybody. Thorough four, Fred. Boy, I'll tell you what, Herman, wherever you go, you bring out the you bring out the everyone. So <laughs> when you start off, you're say something else. Hopefully for good reasons. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure it is. Boo tweezers here as well. So everything so, everything's going everything go, uh, first of all I want to say thank you to everybody who pre-ordered uh the Plum Island Horror. It's almost at 700 now. We're hitting that, getting close to that magic number. There it is. Thank you. Order your copy now. So uh, I I just finished going through over a hundred feedback comments from the play testers and all the logs and all that. So I'm in the process of rewriting the rules now, and then we're going to start a second wave of play testing with a new mod on TTS uh, Tabletop Simulator. And uh, hey, Todd. And, you know, it's been going really great. Thank God the testers love the game. They're really having a good time with it. You know, we're just getting some of the kinks worked out. Some of the balancing issues, which, as you can imagine, when you have six factions and variable, uh, the monsters can move variably and spawn variably. You can imagine the balancing issues <laughs> are, are nuts. Right. Right. So uh, a lot of this is just, you know, determining uh, to make sure that no faction is overpowered or underpowered, because I don't want one of those situations where uh, somebody writes on Board Game Geek that, oh, just take these two factions and you'll always win, you know, that right. kind of thing. Right. You know? Or don't take this faction because you'll get crushed. So we want to avoid that. Um, what else has been going? Oh, so I, I, last weekend I went up to uh, Mark Walker's house up in Virginia and spent a weekend up there, and we, we played some games. So that was fun. Uh, finally played some face-to-face -face games. We played Great War Commander, which I love Combat Commander, the, you know, the system itself, but I especially like Great War Commander because I like World War I more than World War II. And that, that game is so much fun. I love it. Uh, for you 40K fans... We played um, Heroes of Blackreach by Devil Pig Games. I don't know if you, it's based on the Heroes of Normandy system. Have you played that, Dean? No, no. No? Okay. So uh, th this is the Warhammer 40K version of that system. It's very colorful, very well done, great system. Don't start me off because I'll have to go and check that out on Google now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what else did we play? We played Escape from the Dark Castle, which is a game that Rob Warren, the strong man of wargaming, uh, featured one time, and I looked at it and go, oh, "That looks kind of cool." So I, that's a that's a card game. It's a kind of a, it's a dungeon card game, kind of a choose your own adventure type of feel to it, where you're flipping cards. But it's so interactive. Like I can play it with my kids. I can play it with my wargaming friends. I play it with Nancy. Everybody loves it because it's just this kind of conversational. Roll some cool looking dice and make a decision. You know, and you you flip a card if you do well. Etc. What else did we play? We played David Thompson's uh, "For What Remains," which is uh, another great. David doesn't mm -hmm. make bad games. That I mean, <laughs> is a great game. And we played uh, Galaxy Defenders. Oh which, right. You know about that one, Kurt? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's kind of sword and sorcery type. I think it's the same company. Yeah. 
Yeah. They got the coolest looking custom dice, these these D10s with all these symbols on them. It's just so neat. Right. But that was a fun game. That's kind of a sci-fi dungeon crawly thing. That was good. So and then we played a little Battle Lore second edition. So it was, it was a great weekend. A lot, of, a lot of fun. Awesome. Awesome. Sounds like a lot of fun. Next yeah. time you can invite us. No, that's okay. Team, <laughs> <laughs> what have you been up to, man? You've been quiet all week. I sent out emails, and Herman got back with me, and just, just been bonkers. I haven't put a video out this week, so um, a bit, bit of a shame about that. But I'm still working my way, coming to the end of my love affair with uh, the Marmite type game of uh, or Vegemite um, Atlantic Chase, um, playing a scenario. So the, the first part of that should be up, will be up next week. Hope to get the second part done and then um, I'll have to put it away. I just think it's a brilliant game. It's going to be one of my top 10 games of the year when we do that thing uh, at the end <coughs> of the year. Um, I have to say, your enthusiasm for the designs getting me to check it out. I wasn't originally, I'm not, I don't usually do naval games, but you're starting to sway me here. <laughs> check out the playthrough when I post it. I mean, there's some playthroughs on it already, but um, check out, you know, the, the it is it's a sort of cat and mouse thing going on. Even though you're playing on, you're playing solitaire. Right. Uh, there's, there's a bot that tells you what what it does, and it's quite an involved little bot. Um, yeah. uh, and of course, if it makes a daft, you think, no, I wouldn't do that, would it? Do it because it's a bit like um, other things where you think, oh, that, that's a silly thing. But in the end, it was just one of those mad things it did, and, and they won the game with it. The bot won the game with it. So um, wow. it's quite a – yeah, it, it's not bad. Yeah, from the way you described it, it sounded very intriguing as far as, like, not knowing exactly what's going on on the table. Yeah. It, again, if you put in these blocks down or these segments down and you think, oh, dear, oh, no. But that's, that's just to tell you there is a convoy or there is a task force there. Mm-hmm with a battle cruiser in it and a battleship, but you don't know exactly where it is. And you want to send your, you want to move your convoy away from that, or you want to send your, your guys in to try and find it and see, because you get un right. unidentified task forces as well. You don't know what they are until you encounter them. So it could be anything from a couple of destroyers to four battleships, you know, so. Um, it sounds, it sounds, it reminds me the way you describe it, it reminds me of an old Yaquinto game called Raider. I don't know if anybody out there who's wow. on the chat remembers that game, I but do. it was about uh, the German raiders, the uh, surface raiders, I think in the Indian Ocean, if I remember correctly. And they had this really cool system where a, a U-boat could go sink a ship, but the Allied player wouldn't know about it exactly t until later on. So you'd get a late report of where the U-boat sinking was. It, and so you weren't quite sure. Like you had an idea that it was in that area, but you weren't sure exactly where the U-boats were. And you'd have to start scatter, you know, going yeah, there and around. around. It's a yeah, it was a, re a really clever design. You, you Quinto had some great games back yeah, in the day. They did. And also with, with the, the game here, you get the Intel markers where some in intelligence comes in. So right. they said, yeah. oh, it might be on that segment. That's where we got the last bit of info. Mm-hmm. That gives you a bit of an advantage, or you may get a contact. We actually see the task force, and this is all they're all dice roll modifiers that help you find and move and thin down that trajectory to right. nothing. To, yeah, when you, cool. to when you get it, but yeah. yeah. So after that, hopefully, I will be. Um, see, because people send me games occasionally, and it, uh, you know, you, you've got to do, do something. I've done an unboxing of it, I'm going to do attempt a playthrough of uh across the bug river because i loved uh crossing the line arkham oh uh, oh that's a drink herman oh sorry oh, said, oh. every time dean says he loves something it's a drink hmm. so i'm going to try that and uh after that another game was sent to me from strategy martyr um uh i forget what it's called now like the l <laughs> and if we're walking, you'll stand up and show us. I've never seen the back of Dean before. <laughs> Not much to see. It's a bit dangerous. Um, Karaten, um, which uses a pack of cards. to No dice, pack of cards. And then I want to bring out Lock and Load Tactical, but I love the game, and I got sent um, the Africa one, but I don't feel confident enough to play it. 
to, uh, to video it. I love to play it. I don't feel confident to play it. So I'll think I'm going to bring out uh, a game, uh, a video, a game from them that doesn't get a lot of love is uh, uh, Nations at War. So um, mm -hmm. I might do that next. That'll be sort of next sort of three lots of games I may well do. Cool. But as you know, but as you know, games come out and you go, oh no, I'm just going to put that to the back of the queue. Uh, I'll do this one now. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that's the plan. Sorry, I've, I've, that's, uh, that's the way it goes, right? As a matter of fact, I don't know if you guys saw on Facebook today, but apparently Worthington just announced that they're doing a Pacific version of Band of Brothers. Oh no, I didn't see that. Yeah. And I haven't played that system, but it looks really cool. And people have spoken very highly of it. I think it's uh, Texas Arrows and yeah. Ghost. Texas, yeah. yeah. Texas Ghost some Panzers. Go yeah, that's right. Ghost Panzers. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the graphics for the Pacific game look, um, they look so cool. Right. I may have to learn that system too. Another one to add to the list. That's yeah, crazy. crazy. Yeah. I need games I can solo though. That's the thing. I hate playing two-handed solo. I'm sure you've done a show on that already. Um, I need I need some kind of AI. I just can't. Other than to just to learn the game, playing competitively against myself just doesn't work. I can't do it. Well, you can always win that way. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Well, uh, you probably don't want to hear what I was playing then. I was playing four-handed fire in the lake. Oh dear! Solo running all four factions at the same oh. time. If you don't like playing solo, coin schemes are not for you. I'm telling that sounds you. sounds impossible. It is pretty impossible. <laughs> it is. There's no surprises in it, but it is with all the decisions you have to make and all of the you know I could do this or I could do this, which is better for me. Right. Well, this would hurt this guy, but then when when it's that player's turn, you. You got to rethink everything. So the turns take a while to do. There is a solo bot for that. I did get the solo bot, but let me oh, tell right. you, it is more confusing than trying uh, to actually just play it for yourself. That's the thing about solo bots in these games. If they're more work than you playing them by yourself, then it's, they're not worth it. They, well, I'll tell you. Here, I'm not saying they're not worth it. it. I'm just saying if you want a, a, a snappy, you know, I want to do my turn, the bot's got to just do something. Right. <laughs> The bot would do that, but I think it's going to take you several games to get that way with the bot. I don't think it's just going to be, oh, here's the bot. Let me roll, boom, boom, done. No, it takes you a while to figure out, oh, I see what the bot's trying to do. And then I roll on this chart. Okay. And then I look at this because there's there's like a hierarchy, mm -hmm. like something as simple as like putting a unit on the on the map. It'll tell you like oh, it wants to put it with its own units or it wants to put mm -hmm. it with U.S. units or, you know, so there's like a little hierarchy chart you got to go through right. for every single piece. So it takes a little while to learn it. I think once you learn it, you'll be okay. But I, I'm like, I don't want to play two or three games just to learn the bot, you know? No, I understand. And it's interesting yeah. uh, with the GMT sale that just came up. So I ended up ordering uh, Stuka Joe's solo uh, system, which looks amazing and i did that for a couple of reasons one is i ended up ordering paz of glory also the new the new edition of it i yeah. played that game what 20 years ago whenever it came out i don't remember 15 years ago an old guy. And i haven't played it was in a long 99 time and I said, wasn't it what's that i think it was 99 when it came out 1999 yeah something like that i guess yeah but uh yeah. yeah but now that he and i love that game that game convinced me that that i mean i had this uh, love of world war one just from a reading point of view but that game convinced me you could game world war one and it destroyed all the stereotypes about well it's nothing but trench warfare blah 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 right it's actually a lot more interesting especially strategically so right. so i ended up getting the the solo bot and uh and um paths of glory because i it, one of the solo uh modules is for paths of glory and then uh Oh, okay. Uh, Dean's video on, on the American Revolution system convinced me to get the tri-pack as my, oh, my one purchase, the three American Revolution. I, I got a weak spot for quads and tri-plaques anyway, because I like <laughs> I like smaller games, and I like getting them all in one package. So right. it's, it's just a nice variability within one box. It's great. Right. That one in particular, I love that. And, uh -huh. um, 
the, it's the, the quality, the mounted boards and everything. Yeah. The other kind of pack, of course, is the men of iron. Tons of stuff. I do like, as you say, getting a, getting a bit for your money. And the same with uh, SPQR, which right. I get. And, and they inherently are also usually easier to play, faster to play, so they're more accessible, right? So you get multiple accessible games in one package. I mean, that's hard. And like you said, the uh, the American Revolution package in particular is really attractive. I mean, I like the yeah. You know, I like I like geeky stuff like they all have their correct uniforms, you know, and right. change, you know, all that right. kind of stuff. I like that. Right. Kind of that was well, a drink. A rough love something again. I, I, <laughs> I, I have to get another bottle. I think. I know you better. You better get your bottle out now. Uh, and and uh, Tweezer says, does that mean if somebody sends me a game, I automatically love it? No. If I don't want the game, I won't contact them and say, oh, quite like the look of that game. Mm -hmm. Any chance, you know. Um, so yeah, that's I, I don't, you know, get contacted on a daily basis. <laughs> it's a lot of uh, begging. Um, but <laughs> the other thing that happened in the GMT sale, I've finally been convinced there's Hexy doing his playthroughs and um, Tony Stigler. They finally wore me down, and I've gone and got um, the GMT. Not Twin Peaks, the other one. Um, Shenandoah? Yeah, Battles for the Shenandoah. What are they called? Death yeah. Valley. Um, and I've also ordered the Stuka Joe thing because mm -hmm. listening to Ardwolf the other day, said the game that got him into American Civil War was for the people. Mm. Right. So I've got an order of that as well. There's also now, a uh, CNC Ancients in there, I think, too, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I figured if I get that, then maybe it'll maybe it'll work for Battle Lore because it's basically a fantasy DNC. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. It should do. Yeah, and also maybe one day get Cards of Glory, you know, because um, everybody's playing that. But the only other thing I've got to be convinced on now is Napoleonics, and that's it. I'll be away. <laughs> and Napoleonics are great. I love it. I just need to get me a really good system and try it out, and I been looking i haven't jumped on anything yet because i want to i want to compare systems and find out which one's going to work for me the hexa one gets a lot of, lot of, lot of love does it the, hexa the hexa system. same one yeah 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 that one gets a lot of love because it seems to be right in the middle of not too complex but not too simplified either right right yeah that's probably the one i was actually going to look at that this week to kind of narrow down which one i want to get but i'm like ah I'm a little bit behind in my game fund budget is a little low right now. I was looking at um, uh, Field Commander Napoleon. Yeah. Is that the, or Napoleon. Yeah. The, the, the DVG. Uh, the DVG one? Yeah. Field oh, Commander yeah. Napoleon. Yeah. I mean, that's massive, though. That's the only thing. You get that. You talk about having to find playing time. Yeah. Very big. Oh, very I big. Sexy I also, yeah. not that I got a chance to finish what I was doing this week with you two babbling the whole time. It's like having two um, Tonys. You asked me to be co-host. I'm trying to co-host. Uh, yeah. I also played D-Day Dice with a, oh, a, a I saw the expansion. That. that was super cool. Was it good? Yeah, yeah. I like that with all the expansions and um, there's a lot, you know, the, the base game kind of just, I wouldn't call it generic, but it's kind of just you know, there's not too much depth to it and stuff, but when you start adding in all the expansions, you got medals, you have field promotions, you have all, you know, all these different things that you have to start taking into account when you're deciding what you want to do or what you don't right. want to do with your dice. So, and uh, it adds a whole bunch of new boards and ways to play. There's now one of the expansions add like, um, you don't just start on the beach. You stand at, You start in your landing craft, and you got to go through the ocean, dodging the bombs and the waves and everything, and, and you're trying to keep as much resources so when you land on the beach, that's what you're starting, what you're mm -hmm. going to start with. So that cool. was super cool. Yeah, it was right. a lot of fun. I liked it with all the expansions, so it's really made a lot of replayability. A lot, <clears throat> there's a lot more boards to play. Uh, there's like, um, what do they call them now? Legendary units now. So instead of just playing as the United States or playing as Great Britain, now you choose a legendary unit 
and each legendary unit has their own set of capabilities and special powers and some special cards that they'll add to the deck and stuff like that. So very cool. Yeah. It, well, looks, it, it, looks, it does look cool. It's a, you can play it cooperatively. Can you? Oh yeah. 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 yeah solo co-op. You plays up to four people, I believe. Right. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, it's a nice little system, the RWB system, where you're trying to get matches, basically. Kind of mm -hmm. like a a Yahtzee ripoff kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, I was going to say a little Yahtzee-ish, yeah. 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 So, yeah, um, that was that. And then I did... Um, did did you do War of the Rings this week? Yeah, and Marvel. I did some War of the Rings, but I don't consider that a war game. I did some Marvel Heroes, but I also played Under Falling Skies. Yes, I've seen that being played, yeah. Uh, I've so got that the, was really fun. I've got this the is, I consider this a solo one. war game, right? Who wouldn't consider this a solo war game? Would you consider this a war game? Nah, that one I don't think quite makes the... <laughs> the Why? Why would you say it doesn't qualify? It's got combat. Yeah, it does. <laughs> right? It has enemy units. It has a map. What doesn't it have that war games have? Uh, all right. It's, a, it's Space Invaders. Space Invaders. Yeah, but Space of, Invaders is of kind of a war game. It, there you go. Yeah. I've got with a lot of strategy. With I've a lot of strategy. I've got a version of it. So, you know, it's, it's good. It's good. It's a bit of fun. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, well, I know we've gone that you've gotten that argument a hundred times. Like uh, we played a couple days ago. I have one friend here. We play a lot of card games. We played Shards of Infinity, which is a deck building game. Yeah, and that that was a lot of fun. But again, that that's also combat between science fiction factions and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I mean, hey, look, I have a very liberal view of what a war game is. If it has conflict in it, conflict simulation, killing things. <laughs> <laughs> defeating people, I then it's a it's a war game. Yeah. Yeah. Well, under falling skies, you're constantly shooting down. All right, all right. I'll all give right. it to you. I'll <laughs> give it to you. <laughs> That's the boy. That a boy. I'll drink to that ID Jester wins an argument. <laughs> hey. Hold on, hold on. By the way, this is Chattanooga whiskey for you bourbon lovers out there. Very good. It's so it's a bourbon, not a whiskey, even though it's called a whiskey. What's that? It's it's a bourbon, but it's called a whiskey, but it's not a whiskey. It's a bourbon. Right. So whiskeys is a grand. It's Scotch whiskey, rye whiskey, bourbon whiskey, be, Tennessee certain, whiskey. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of whiskeys. Yeah. It's got to be certain percentage to be called. Bourbon. It's uh, yeah. It's what they're made of. So bourbon, I think, is fifty-one percent corn. It has to be done in new oak barrels. There's a certain proof point when it goes into the barrel. There's a whole bunch of rules. Is what you can call whatever. Like Scotch can only come from Scotland. Even if you get Japanese scotch, they have to get their liquor, their their base liquor from Scotland. Really? Or yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, you, you don't upset the Scottish, my goodness. No. No, you don't piss them off. It's <laughs> invading everywhere, saying, you know, <laughs> thank goodness on our side, is what I can say. But yeah, I, can't, right. I, can't drink, I can't drink scotch. It just makes me, I can't drink it. But bourbon, I mm -hmm. love bourbon. So I assume it's what it's made of because corn, isn't it? Bourbon. Corn, and, yeah. Yeah. And I haven't tried rye whiskey, but uh, yeah, Scottish whiskey. It's amazing. Um, you know, it's amazing. I used to drink scotch. I moved to Tennessee and everything here because we're so close to Kentucky and everything in Tennessee, Kentucky, bourbon. everything's bourbon. So I started getting into and do some research. It turns out every guy and sometimes every woman I talk to, if I mention bourbon, it's like a 20 minute conversation about what are you drinking? What's your favorite? Yes, I'm really into bourbon. You know, so everybody's like into it. So the waiters at restaurant, we had dinner last night and I said to the waiter, are you into bourbon? He goes, oh, yeah. <laughs> I, go, so, and he was off. yeah. I said, give me a give me a suggestion, you know. <laughs> but it's the same with with uh, scotch balls. You get them as well, you know. So uh, it, they know, oh, no, it's a bit peaty, this one. I don't like this one because it's a bit sweeter. This one, they go, hello, Mo. Mo There's Mo here. Mo I sent Mo a message today. He did a nice unboxing of Crowbar uh, yeah. earlier today. Nice video. Thank you, Mo. Great game. I enjoyed, I enjoyed my yeah, enjoyed when I played it as well. Yeah, Mo oh, does nice unboxings. It, yeah, really. Nice 
No. <laughs> you are automatically included in the club. <laughs> I have, I have, Mo does great unboxings. Yeah. yeah so, Mo so has now. started talking whiskey and he appears. That's, <laughs> That's true. That's Mo for you right there. What about uh, uh, Mark Herman Luttman doing um, new videos on the Pacific War? Does that mean Mark Herman Luttman's game is coming out? I'm being silly, Herman. Oh, Mark, okay. I was going to say Mark. Mark Herman. <laughs> Mark Herman. Mark Herman. Mark Herman. I All right. I got it. I oh, got it. it's wasted. It's wasted. But he's been doing these loads of, of instructional videos on Pacific oh, War. Oh, he's been doing Empire of the Sun, right? No, Pacific War. He's doing oh, Empire oh, of the Pacific Sun War. tonight okay, right. on another channel. Won't come on ours, but he's gone on another channel. But I just wondered, seriously, I was just wondering, does that mean it's imminent if he's starting to do videos on it? I guess. It's, it's <laughs> taken a while. Well, I mean, maybe he's just trying to get people ready. I don't know. <laughs> right? Thanks, thanks, Todd. I was only joking anyway. He's got yeah. that British sense of humor, Mark. Uh, or awesome. Herman. You just Sometimes you just got to let it go in one ear and out the other. I've been into just... British humor since I was into Monty Python back in the 70s at college. So I uh, got the why British do you humor. Say Monty Python. What's that? Why do you say Monty Python? Monty Python. No? It's Monty Python. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Did but I, I know that? You know, yeah, Monty Python. Oh, yeah. It's just the way you guys say oh, it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna oh, get see what you, see what you get for signing up for this there herman oh my abuse, God. abuse for abused right 29 abuse. minutes and 36 seconds so here's my question all right so you kind of talked about this a little bit in the beginning of the show about you're designing um paul myelin or with six, six different factions and obviously, each of the factions are going to play differently. They're going to different do different things. They're going to kind of have different abilities and different units and all that. And you want to obviously balance it so all the units are equal or kind of equal in power and can kind of do what they need to do in well, different yeah, ways. It's okay to have them specialize in something as long as another unit in that faction can specialize in something else so that you kind of get, you don't want one faction that only does combat or only does searching or, you know, right. that kind of thing. Right. So I guess, I guess what I'm, I'm, I'm my question is how do you, you're going to have these people that are, Oh, this, this, this race or this faction's the best and these are the terrible ones and they're going to rank them and everything. And that's going to come no, no doubt. But how do you get it so that people, want to play other factions to try them out how do you how do you get it so that one faction just doesn't isn't a, just a copy of another faction but do different things how, how does that how is the pro i guess the, my biggest fear is whenever you have six different factions there's always one faction that everyone loves and one faction everyone hates or a couple factions everyone hates is yeah. there a way to kind of prevent well, no, that from happening i don't I don't think there's any way to totally avoid that. The funny thing is our first set of playtest responses, you could tell that all the, all the guys that were playing it the first time were war gamers because everybody took the National Guard. <laughs> so, uh, right, right. so the war gamers just naturally go for the National Guard. So that was kind of interesting. So eventually we told them, look, you got to try some of the other factions out, you know, that kind of thing. Um, one way you do it is make sure that the units have a, a lot of variety as far as their rating so that you can really fine tune them so that they have a more complex character to them. So maybe you give one unit a high combat factor. So you're thinking that's a great combat unit, but it's also very slow, right? And it's horrible at administrative work, but it's got a high bravery rating and it's special power might be something else. So now you've got a very complex thing. So you want to make sure the units are situationally great at something or bad at something. Like you might be in a situation where you have to, so the game, you have to evacuate at least 26 points of civilians or you lose the game, right? It's called the, oh, the humanity level, right? Or condition for defeat. So if you've got this combat thing, killing killing the monsters doesn't matter if you don't, you're not evacuating people. 
right? So you can fine tune all those units in different aspects of the game. So it'll always be interesting, I think, for people to change factions and see if they, they approach a different aspect to the game because there's three ways to lose. So you're not always winning and losing the same way. You 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 can lose at from a certain thing. So you may want to next time you play try a different faction to see if you could prevent that loss condition. Hmm. All right. I, I think Mo's put a, a good point as well. It, it depends that the factions click with different people. You know. And you, exactly. You yes. Favorites. You have your favorites. There's no way around it. Yeah, I agree with that totally. People will be drawn to even, like you said, even the artwork. Somebody will be drawn to, let's say, the Islanders Athletic Club because they play golf, and one of the characters there is a golfer. So somebody yeah. might go, "I'm going to play that," you know, that contingent. If there's a musician or a scientist, that's probably going to right. Make so a, there is a there's the Plum Island Research Laboratory Security Services, which has a bunch of scientists in there, and what they yeah. do is they throw out all these experimental things. You don't know what's going to happen, but they could be very powerful. So it's more of a yeah. chaotic type of faction. But it's right. quite right. No. It's saying, saying here, we want to, what is it? Uh, Tarawa Atoll Zombies. Um, <laughs> Tarawa Atoll Zombies. Right. Right. Actually, I got the inspiration to do the game was actually from me working on my Dunkirk game. Mm -hmm. Because I liked, I, I liked, <clears throat> I liked the dynamic of, so the the, uh, the miracle at Dunkirk game and a spoiled victory, which I think Tony played a week ago or so. The idea is that it's not it's not it's a war game, but the idea is not to defeat the Germans. You can't defeat the Germans. You've right? got to get out the of idea it. is to save the BEF. Right. So your 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 whole goal in the game is to evacuate the soldiers as best as you can and hold back the Germans. So it's a different type of dynamic m militarily, right? So while I was working on that game, I just thought, well, it'd be kind of cool to do this in a modern setting and have the enemy be these, these creatures, right? Just right. pouring down and you're trying to hold them back, kind of like a World War Z type of thing, you know, where you're holding them back and you're, you're trying to save the people and, you know, that kind of thing. So I just thought yeah. that was a, a fun way to do it. Thanks, Chris. Uh, or um, the battle of the bulging and exploding zombies. <laughs> yes. Yeah, right. Yeah, endless. But as far as yeah. as far as balancing the factions, I'll, to be totally honest with you, I design the factions. They they do what they would do historically. So the firefighters do something a certain way. The EMT unit does something a certain way. The golfer can hit driving shots of golf balls and hit hit horror is far away, you know, that kind of thing. And then I just take that and I go, all right, let's see what happens. And you throw it into the mix. And then as you're getting feedback from people, you realize, oh, well, that, okay, that's not working because that's always happening. So now I'm going to create either a new unit or tweak this ability. It's, it's, it's all just design the thing and then see what's happening and then respond to what's happening and, you know, shave it down and mold it and, and get it to work. Will it ever be perfect? No. <laughs> but, you know, uh, it's it's it, the idea is to try to get it so where people don't automatically say this faction stinks or this faction's great. And we've actually had, and, I, and I'm not kidding, I had one entry that said, this faction is fantastic and will always win. And then the next sentence was this the same faction sucks and it'll never win so then you know you got it right 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 yeah so when somebody starts the game do they get to pick their faction are they assigned a faction do they randomly get two and draw the option. one you know i'm not i'm not here to tell you how to play the game people are going to do it the way they want to do it so you can pick them randomly or if you have a favorite faction go ahead and pick them again it, it's up to you you can you can pick them or just assign them I mean, personally, I prefer just to assign them randomly and see what happens. Yeah, that's how I do it, I think. Just take your yeah. chances. Yeah. yeah. I think that's always the best way. Or maybe and, two. And as, and as a player. Two, you got to pick one. Right. It's like playing Root or, or you know, any of those games where you just, let's try a different one because it plays differently. And you've got to think differently and use, you know. Use you do. Yes, so, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's fun because it lets you, you, you know, let you explore the game system a little more and, and see what can I get out of these guys.
instead of playing the same way. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, sorry for hurting you. Oh, that'd <laughs> be fun. Um, gosh, I before I post that up, I had a question, and what were you saying? And now I can't remember what he was going to say. Damn. <laughs> Uh, just so we're talking about the randomly picking your your factors, <clears throat> right? Damn, and, and having to mold them, it'll come back to you. I'm sure it will. It's always the way it is when you're ready to but, say something. I mean, you know, with a game like with a game like Plum Island Horror or Dawn of the Zeds or Invaders from Dimension X, these are these are designed. I mean, I've done super serious war games like a most fearful sacrifice and and at any cost and stone sword where you're you're researching you're trying to get everything right figure out what happened historically and then as a designer i just like to design one of these games where you just design the game yeah you don't worry about historical accuracy you're just trying to design the most fun game you can design and if i'm laughing while i'm designing it then i then i'm doing it right yeah and thank goodness so, you do because not yeah. all do that. And I, I literally sit here in front of the screen and start laughing out hysterically as I'm typing something about a power that some units got or an event card or something. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. You know, if I'm cracking myself up, then I get, well, that won't necessarily crack anybody else up, but at least I'm having a good time doing it, you know? Right. Yes, Mo. Play, I play, that's what I play. You play them for the fun, regardless of the game, don't you? Yeah. If it's not fun, if it's a. Yeah. You know, and. You know, just, there's a few people out there on certain forums oh, who yeah. say, "Oh, don't tell me to have fun while I'm playing games. Aren't supposed to be fun." And I'm like, "Well, you're playing. What? You're playing the games for the wrong reason." <laughs> yeah, I I want to laugh. I want to be surprised. I want to have an adventure when I play. Right. Well, I, I I agree with that, but I also think there are certain games that it's not about the fun. It's about the historic importance you know like Stalingrad 42 isn't meant to be fun it's meant to be an historical simulation yes if right. you're not having fun, read a book you know, right you're, you're having fun in the sense that you're experiencing the history i guess i mean it's not hey, fun we sold another copy for you there Herman. thank you that's going all the way over here and some yeah he's got to <laughs> go all the way to romania or um, where is he from? You know, was it? Let's see where he put right at the top of the chat. I and mean, yeah, I saw what he put in there, and I should know thorough for. I yeah, he's one of your regulars, isn't he? He's one of my regs. Yeah, he's a real good guy. Um, shoot, can't. Remember. Well, doesn't matter, but hopefully you'll get it sometime soon. Hopefully it'll keep moving up the P500 list if we keep getting pre-orders for it. Yeah. So. yeah, I mean, once we get into the 700s, then... Right, that's right. He was living in Malta now, right, right. Well, yeah. right. It'll start moving into the priority list at GMT, yeah. which is nice, yeah. And it's great with GMT that you just click on the SCS, uh, SCG, sorry, uh, option, and they send it to Second Chance Games over here, you know, all the taxes are paid you pay right. your, you pay your postage yeah. when they charge you and that's it forget about it wonderful right. and you save you, i've saved tons of money you know not a king's ransom but it's you get it a bit quicker and it's cheaper so yeah right. Kudos yeah, I mean, to, even, kudos so to. even with historical war games i think you can have fun i mean you know when mark and i were playing great war commander we were having a blast and you know blast you know not haha -ha blast but you know hey this is this feels right. It's a lot of. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just wondering. All I, can, all I can tell you is the more pre orders it gets, the faster it'll get out. Let's put it that way. Well, here, here is. Um, so why, why did Panzer get reprinted with only. A they few have not updated their uh, P500 order. For like two months now, what's going on? They still have nothing in final production. It's been that way since. The I don't month. know. It's been that way for at least two months. Let's see how yeah. we're doing on the P five hundred here. Come on. So why, so why is Penza being reprinted with less than five hundred? Okay. 
I, um, um, I think, I think, I I think the reprints is only as 189. I think the reprints have a different threshold. Ah, uh, I'm not I'm complaining. Not, don't quote me on that because I don't know. I'm not an insider at GMT, but yeah, not complaining. It's amazing how many titles they got up there, though. Yeah, crazy. <laughs> They got a lot at the printer, but obviously the printers are broke because nothing's coming back. That might, be, that might be nothing to do with GMT. They're just waiting on. Yeah. Oh, that's another one we sold that's two today. Thank you. We on commission. That's Boo Tweezers right there. Thank you very much. We're supposed to be playing tomorrow our Fields of Fire. Have you ever played um, Fields of Fire, Herman? No. Bonkers. I, whew, crazy. Yeah. Great. I... That's not anything to say about you know whether I like the system or not. It's I'm just not a tactical World War II or modern. I don't tactical games, and it might be because they're hard to solo properly, I guess. Uh, but I mean, I don't think I've played. Much. That is a solo game. squad leader back in the day, but who didn't play squad leader back yeah. in the day? Mm -hmm. But Fields of Fire is a solo only game. We're playing it cooperatively, but it's a solo game. It's bonkers. Yeah, I mean, it's I it's. Great. It's just one of it's just one of those games that I feel like the the um, the amount of effort I need to put into learning it to play properly. I just don't. That's I just tend to go with games that are easier and more accessible, only because of a time constraint. Like I, you know, I'll be writing rules for three hours in the morning, and then I just make myself take a break and play something. So I can't really get into anything too heavy, you know. Yeah, and it's the same when you. You know, Mo, it's the same with Mo and everybody and, and Tweez. If, when you're videoing stuff, if it takes you six months to learn it, you're, you're going right. to put that to one side. Well, that's, right. Actually, I didn't even think about that. It's hard for you guys to do a complex game and do a video about it because you'd have to. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, well, we've seen Rough for four months. Oh, he's learning Pacific War. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it can be brutal learning that. I, but I, I don't think it's as complex. It's just there's a lot of steps. If you look at the oh, actual right. like steps, like there's a phase, and inside a phase, there's like twelve things you need to check, mm -hmm. and then there's another phase, and there's like twenty things you need to do, and then there's another phase, mm -hmm. and it's just like. 58 phases you got to go through. And if you miss yeah. anything, you know, I don't have to go been. back, which is what happened with us. We landed the hilo, the helicopter at the landing pad, and Tony's units jumped off. And then uh, we did our completion of the round. And then Boot Tweezers is like, oh, we shouldn't have done that because there's already units shooting into the LZ. The helicopter wouldn't have come down and landed, so now we got to rewind because we missed one of the steps. Okay, and and you, you kind of hit on the on the, on the the one of the reasons that I stopped doing those kinds of games is exactly that reason. You, you spend all that time to set the game up, and, and then two turns in, you find out you did something horribly wrong, right. and now we got to go all the way back. Yeah. undo everything reset up everything and you know I, to be honest with you i've never really been into monster games i mean i think the biggest monster game i ever played was la bataille de moscova which is the old la bataille system on the battle of Borodino. but that's when i was i was 20 something years old at, down at the you know i mean we're like sponges then aren't we like sponges oh my god yeah yeah hmm. But your that um, you know fearful what's name that's quite that's not a small game is it? Most fearful sacrifice. Yeah, it's not a small. Well, game. that's see that's the interesting thing, and we'll get into this when you want to do your topic later. But it's big physically. It's not big rules counter. density and counter. It's not a huge counter, is it? Lots of counters. There's not a lot compared to a monster. monster. A lot of the games. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, and, and we'll mention this later because I know what topic you want to talk about, but my rule books tend to run long, but they're not running long because there's a lot of rules in them. There's a lot of explanation in them. <laughs> yeah. I tend well, to over explain stuff. Didn't see the title. We're topic today is dun, 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 ways to make games easier to learn. 
I think that would be a great topic with someone that is. Excuse me, I think the dog wants to go out. Okay. <laughs> I figured that'd be a great topic to have with a designer here who's going through this as we speak, kind of going through how do I get people to understand how to play my game? How am I going to get people to learn how to operate it? We've You've got plenty of play testers now that you've had to go through and teach them how to do things already. Mm -hmm. So I thought that would be a good subject to talk about, um, which we'll get to in a little bit. But guys in the chat, just think about things that you might want to ask about or comments that you might want to you know give us when we start talking about this. So uh oof. busy week, man. I'm telling you, I was a busy guy this week. Lots of things going on, and I'm sorting things and resorting things and so, you know, when so you get a game and is one of my like all these expansions, like you know, like just D Day Dice, yeah, right? Don't, don't you consider that like therapy? I love I love doing it. I, I love it. I'm just too. whistling and I'm having a good time. Just oh, sort of, so I mean, you're if you at a lot of table right now. I got cards and stuff yep. like literally everywhere. Right. right. So you're into a lot of card games like I am, and I just I just love sorting the cards, putting them in their dividers. I even if if the card if the game needs a lot of shuffling, I always put it in sleeves. That's what so I've been doing, the whole time. and that's like you <laughs> know, like uh, Art all Wolf does the counter color. clipping. Well, I could do a show about card sleeving because that's what I do, right? And Ooh, card uh, sleeving, but come in the wrong. Oh, I love card sleeving. All my cards, <laughs> every. Well, it's like counter clipping, right? And counter. Right. Be so, done. speaking of card games, have you played the Marvel Champions yet? Herman? Yes. Yes, I have. What do you think? I, it's a great, it's it's fantastic system. Yeah, it is really really good. I think it's really solid. There think, are there are so many great card games out there. There really are. People have been designers have been very innovative with the way they've done card games. It's yeah. it's a, it's remarkable. The Arkham Horror card game is amazing. Uh, like even like Shards of Infinity is amazing. Um, God, there's so many good ones. Lord of the I Rings the living card game. Uh, I have a lot playing that. Pirate themed Ascension game is really cool too. I mean, it's great. Ascension, legendary, yeah. Legendary. Aeon's End. Well, legendary, the legendary games are great. Yeah. So uh, there's a lot out there, and the cool thing about card games, going back to what we were talking about before, most of them are really accessible and easy to play, and a lot of them can be played solitaire. Right. 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 Like Shards of Infinity has a, a good solo bot where you where you fight this evil bad guy who kicks my butt every time. But that's why I keep going back to it because it's so challenging and interesting. And if you do something wrong, resetting that game is, is simple. It's, okay, reshuffle the cards, boom, start all over again. Yeah. Do you sleeve all your cards? Most not all, your, not most all of them. Game. No. I only sleeve the the games that require, and that's mostly the deck building that require a lot of shuffling. Yeah. Um, sometimes I'll only sleeve part of a game. Like sometimes they have a deck that gets shuffled all the time. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think that's like my Aeon Zen. I've uh, the turn co order cards. I've got those sleeved in the yes. And, and yeah, like I, player I cards. have this weird, but the weird enemy obsession. cards. I don't because they never get shuffled. It's just right. And I also have this weird hang up that I'm always afraid that the cards that are supposed to stay secret, I'm somehow going to damage them. So I'll know what they are. So I sleeve them right, right. away. So I don't damage right. them. <laughs> so you wouldn't like cards that have different colored backs. Oh, you? God. No, how did you how did it get how in, uh, any of uh, it wasn't even seriously. Right. Would you like you know, when you look at your deck of cards, you gotta have all the same background. Yeah. Right? I actually don't have my glasses on, so what are you holding up? What game are you holding up? Uh, don't don't encourage him. Oh, well, oh, if you want to, I'll show you. Um, it's got the pictures. Oh, no, did did I go down a rabbit hole here? here? How he I let apologize to here. everybody in chat for doing this. Yeah, <laughs> ah, here we go, Herman. How he let from what you were talking about, Herman, to this again. Look here at this. Go. Look oh, at that. The DVG. Okay. I have, I've okay. got. Bed. So Look at one. that. Look at how many uh, different colors are there, Herman. Is that which game is that? That is uh Tiger Leader. Okay. So the way you solve that problem is you do the colored backs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So the, the other way I could do it is I could pay DVG to send me the updated cards as well and fix their own. Well, problem. you could do that, or you could just buy the the sleeves that have the black on one side and the clear on the other, and then it solves that problem. It's one of my hangups, one of my pet peeves now. It's the cards. I, I don't understand how GMT can print an expansion for a game that has been out of print for six years and the cards look exactly the same. Yeah. But certain other companies can't get it right. I, I don't understand. I, I can only imagine that it's the public the the printer that they use can't match the die exactly whatever it is but how you doing dean <laughs> all right i don't mo 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 sums it up perfectly what mo say oh he's not going to put it up he is he might put it up who's uh yes yeah, there we are i made a mistake <laughs> I won card, <laughs> and I'll never hear the uh, end of it now. <laughs> never. That's a good one, Mo. Now, we've been talking about this for a while, and maybe you don't know this, Herman, but you know how Mo's got Whiskey Charlie, right? Yes. Well, Whiskey Charlie was supposed to take on the war room in Tank Duel, and okay, they keep it out. They never, they won't sign up and decide on a day to do this. So, I find that hard to believe because I believe that uh, they. Yeah, I, and try, I email. I talk to, do to them. I, I, I don't. I, I've done everything under the sun to try and get these guys on board to take this on. But are you saying that they're afraid that you are going to wipe them? I think they're a little bit scared after they saw our playthrough of um, of Tank Leader the other, you know, a couple weeks ago or a month ago. I don't know. I can't imagine Gimpy getting intimidated by anybody, but. Well, it should be fun. I mean, we were going to try and do, we were trying to organize that, but then they had a convention coming up and then, you know, Tony shows up once a year to do <laughs> spots. <laughs> Leave him alone. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, I, I do apologize for me gesticulating. The dog's being a, a pain in the bottom. Yeah, the yeah. Way, it's funny because I'm I'm home alone with my dog too, and I closed the door so he wouldn't bother me. So. Uh, no, right. the wife's away for the weekend, gone to a wedding. I did fancy, mm -hmm. and uh, I thought, oh, great. But of course, normally this time the dog is with her, and she's yep. sorting out. The yeah, I got the same issue. Yeah, yeah, pain in the bum. But there we are. So apologies. That's all right. We understand. You know, <laughs> life comes in and interrupts the show every once in a while. So, uh, so uh, does anybody have any questions for Herman about before we get into our subject about anything on on his plate on things he's doing on the upcoming game? Anybody have any uh, before we delve into our subject matter for the day? Oh, it's supposed to be the Battle of Armageddon. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. That's, that's uh, right. That's right. We're supposed to do a Battle oh, of Armageddon. I, I actually played that game at Mark's the last time I went there. It's it's interesting. It's not a it's not a take a seriously type of game, is it? You just nuke everybody. There's Chris, boy. Chris is all over the place. Oh, I he, tell you, he's you can't shut him up. Which is my favorite mechanic. Don't you dare say chip pull. I would have to think about that a little bit. What is my favorite mechanic? You know, CDG? The huh? CDG? Card driven game? No, I, I think he, he, no, actually, it's funny. CDG games I've avoided. I kind of burned out of them back in the 90s or whatever, and, and I haven't gone back except for this recent uh, ordering of Paths of Glory. Uh, yeah, I won't say I won't say the chit pull. Uh, boy, what mechanic do I like the best? Uh, well, I'll tell you. It's a mechanic that you haven't seen yet. I just submitted a game to Worthington. Ooh, oh, you breaking that. news, folks! Breaking news. Called Death by Flags and Trumpets. 
It's uh, the Western Front, 1914. Uh, it's the opening of the war till December. And in that, I use an activation system for the armies that's, I, I probably mentioned this before, but it's it's based on what they call the, ri the river system, which is used in Conan and in um, uh, Batman Gotham City, I believe. So I... I saw, I actually haven't played either of those games, but I saw them being played and I got the idea because I said, well, that would be really cool to activate armies. So the idea is you have a track and each box has a certain cost in it, starting from one, going up to three, and then there's the last box is four. And what you do is you put your army chits in each of these boxes. So let's say first army in the first box, second army in the second box, third army, third box, if you're the Germans. So when it's your turn, you have a certain amount of action points you can spend. The first armies in the track would only cost one or two AP to activate. So you activate them, you spend your AP. And then what you do is you take that army and you slide it to the end of the track and you shove everybody down. Okay. Uh -huh. now, that, now the costs have changed for these other armies. But the army you just activated is in the last box at the most expensive box. So if you wanted to activate that army a second time, it would cost you Lots. a good yeah. chunk of change to activate it, right? So that abstractly represents the cost of putting all your resources into one army and just activate mm -hmm. ignoring the others. But it also does those, it, it basically makes you activate your entire army because these armies shove down the <laughs> chart. I keep hitting my microphone, I'm sorry. Okay. They, they shove down the chart. So now you're activating all these other armies and they're coming off the chart and the thing's moving down. And how you manipulate that and how you plan for that is kind of a very abstracted way to do command control at the really high level where you're, you're funneling your resources towards certain armies. There are certain cards in the German army, like German general staff, that says if you play this card, you can activate any army for one AP. So that gives the Germans a really cool advantage. Right where they can they can use that 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 better command structure that they had in World War One to maybe activate an army a second time cheap, so you get that big drive into Belgium or whatever you know. So that that mechanic, as I massaged it through the whole playtesting process, turned out to be really cool. It works great. You get this real interesting decision point of, you know, where am I putting these armies? Which one do I activate to make the next one cheaper? How do I set myself up for the next round? If I'm looking at the opponent, you know, what is, what's he doing? Who did he just activate? Well, it'll cost him a lot to activate that army again. So I think he's going to activate this army over here, you know? So that, that's probably my favorite mechanic that I've come up, up with in the last year or so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So have you'll you see that ever, from Worthington eventually. Grant's going to get back to me soon about that. Have you ever heard of or played Keyforge? I have heard of Keyforge. I've not played it. Okay. You should check out the mechanics for Keyforge because I think there is a golden opportunity to take that system mm -hmm. and put it into a war game. <clears throat> so basically, all your different cards are going to have symbols on them, and right. you're going to have your play area is going to have so many cards and then you're going to place cards down. And then based on, you can only choose one faction basically. Right. So you, fire off faction, you could have each right. individual division on here. Right. Right. So that's interesting. I think, that, I think that would be a really cool, I think with the, some minor tweaks to that system, I think you could take key for right. And, and the point of like saying that anyway, and, and your point is that, and I, I know I've said this to every on every podcast I've been on, but I play all these other games not only because I can play with a bunch of guys or solo and 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 have a little fun, but I also learn mechanics that are not traditional war game mechanics. That as I'm playing the game, I'm going, "Oh my god, this would work great in this setting or that setting," or you know, and. I think one thing wargaming needs is just some fresh ideas for how to manipulate the game system to do. I'm not saying it shouldn't be a historical war game or anything like that, but 
even the historical war games could benefit from just different mechanical approaches. So, you know, either the, you know, the system I'm trying to use for the World War I game, in the, even in the Plum Island Horror, which I do consider a war game because there's conflict, but, you know, I got, I got mechanics in there from Aeon's End, from Clank. So you play Clank a lot, right? Yeah. So the whole, yeah. I have a, I played Clank too, and I loved Clank, and I rem always remembered the colored cubes in the bag. Right. Right? Right. So in Plum Island Horror, what you do is every time you have a close combat with the horrors, you put a colored cube in the bag, and that's the biohazard bag. So the uh, more close contact you have with the horrors, the more and more infection and disease and nastiness is created. Uh, then once every, at the end of every turn, you're going to go into that bag and you're going to draw two cubes out. And depending on what color they are, they're going to increase the infection track. So uh, that that comes from Clank. And that's one way you could probably lose too, right? Pulling those cubes out and finding out what you got, right? Uh, question from the Boot Tweezers. I think you mentioned in the past about a blind swords Inkerman. I was thinking about that myself. Could we oh, have a chat on that? Yes, I would love. I would love Inkerman. If there's a battle that's tailor made for blind swords, it would be Inkerman. Because yeah. Inkerman was in the Crimean War, it occurred in a thick fog, and both sides, the Russians and the British and the French, lost contact with their units during the entire battle. It was basically a battalion battle. I think they, I believe it's called the Soldiers' Battle, right? And if there was ever a battle that was designed for blind swords and the historical chaos of blind swords, it would be that battle, as as both players are playing and things are happening their units are doing things that they're not counting on at all because they're lost in this fog and i would definitely talk to you about that because i've thought about doing it i've had people suggest inkerman to me i just haven't had time to work on it so if blue teasers wants to work on something like that that would be fantastic he's a bit of a you know on the choir a bit of a designer you know oh on okay the, on the choir on the choir he said we've got chats and he's got ideas and things yeah. yeah yeah and Inkerman's one of those you know you always you always try to find battles that haven't been covered that much that was my whole that's why I'm, I'm I'm particularly proud of at any cost only because well not but for one it, it was it was it was a camp it's a campaign that nobody's ever done before as a, as a study just on that campaign right they've done the Battle of Mars Latour they've done the Franco-Prussian War in general but they've never covered those three or four days around the fortress of Metz and what happened during the Franco-Prussian War. So I did manage to find in that case something that hasn't been done before. And you're always looking for that one, you know, David Thompson does it right with Castle Itter, right? And uh, the new one, the Postman's Uniform uh, game, right? Where he managed to find these battles that haven't been covered before. And, and that's what you're really looking for. So inkerman has been covered before, certainly, but not to the extent I think it could be. I, it's, the Crimean War in general is pretty interesting. I know Alma's been covered a few times. Uh, Balaclava, not so much, only because it's kind of just known for the Charge of the Light Brigade. But, you know, as far as a competitive game, it's not really there. But uh, Inkerman is definitely in the top of my list of, of battles to do, along with Verdun. I would love to do Verdun. Hmm. All right, well, before we get too late in the afternoon, it's already 10 after 5, so we're getting down on limited time already. Let's go ahead and talk about our subject for today, because I'm sure Herman said that he's got a lot to talk about on this. I'm sure Dean and you guys in the chat have some thoughts on it, but we're going to talk about ways to make things easier for war gamers to learn a new game or learn a new system and uh, things that we think that might help game companies or sales or whatever. Like, for example, uh, you know, I get a lot of different games in, war games, regular games, this, that, and the other thing. And, like, I can go online and I can watch, like, say, Gloomhaven or when I bought uh, Under Falling Sky. There's, like, tutorial videos and everything out there for that game but when mm -hmm. i get a war game in 
there's a lot of unboxing videos and look at what's in the box and stuff, but there's not a lot of tutorials on how to play the game. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I was thinking, you know, this week is like, damn, it is so hard for new people to get a new war game and literally learn it easily, I guess is the best way to put it easily. So mm -hmm. I'm thinking, what can we do as, what can game companies do? What can YouTubers do? What can designers do to make it easier for people to learn war games? Yeah. Oh, you, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, can, I can tell you, I can tell you before Mark and I played Great War Commander, I watched Harsh Rules by Ben Harsh. Okay. Have you ever watched any of his videos? Yeah. 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 He's done one on. Uh, yeah. yeah. He's done. Uh, he just did last hundred yards. yards I think. Yeah. He just did the last hundred yards. Yep. So a guy, and I, I know there's others, but Ben Harsh in particular, <laughs> his production value, or his presentation, I should say, you know, the way he does the graphics and all that. Yeah. Must take him out. Fantastic. I mean, I learned Great War Commander just by sitting there and watching that video. Right, and I agree with you that for the war games, that's a rarity, right? Um, I know Gimpy does some, and I mean, there's other guys that do those kinds of things. I think Ben Harsh is is probably the most well produced, right, as far as the full presentation. Um, but obviously, you got Rodney Smith's Watch It Played, which I think he did. Command and Colors, Samurai Wars, I, Samurai Battles, I think. Yeah, these, these, uh, so he's, he's kind of, Euro yeah. Troopers are starting to, yeah, it's starting to wiggle in there. GMT is yeah, wiggling right. in there. Right. <laughs> it's, it's good. I mean, it's a good sign, yeah, right? Good thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, so even like Rodney Smith, if I was trying to learn a non war game, I would go to Rodney. And it, if, even if he didn't do every little rule, he at least made the game, you know, it was a comprehensive review of how to play the game. So at least I wasn't starting totally blind. Right. So maybe we need somebody like that, even not as to the extent that Ben Harsh, but maybe a video presentation of at least an introduction into conceptually how a game works. So at least you, you have a framework, right? So when you sit down and set it up, you need at least know basically, I mean, how many times have you, and I distinctly remember one game that I read the rules on a plane going to Colorado. And I remember when I came home, I read the rules thoroughly, thought I knew how to play the game, and I set it up and I just went blank. Right. Because it didn't really right. explain how to play the game. It, it had the well, rules, I mean, boom, 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 boom. But I, I still got lost. I still didn't know how to translate that into what I was looking at on the board. I think, I think the, one of the problems, there's so many games come out. You can't keep up with them. YouTube. That's true. Red, that was not a problem in the seventies, right? Not one Avalon Hill game, and yeah, 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 every month or whatever. But um, YouTube. See, and I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be the devil's advocate right here, right? Okay. Because How unusual. Yeah, I know. Somebody's <laughs> got to be the bad guy. It's always got to be me for some reason, but that's okay. I, I have big shoulders, right? There are a lot of war games coming out, but there's also a lot of Euro games. There's also a lot of card games. There's a lot of, there's hundreds of games coming out every month, right? You only have a few people, dedicating people that are doing this. The people that you have mentioned, Harsh Rules and uh, play, Watch It Played and stuff, they don't just focus on war games. They do regular games as well. So they mm -hmm. just, with all these other war games that are coming out, and all these other regular games, non-war games, let's say non-war games coming out, there is a lot more coverage for the not-war gamers mm -hmm. out there. Because there is a lot more <laughs> YouTube creators on that side of the fence. And there's a lot so, more customers. Yes. There are a lot <laughs> more customers. You look at the subscribers these people get compared to war game YouTube creators, and they're in they're astronomical what i think like ben uh, ben harsh um bringing out his his great content that takes that must take absolute 
an age to do each game. So you're not right, going to get yeah. one of those every week. Yeah. And what I think what game manufacturers ought to do is, and they're starting to get to that, is to utilize the YouTube creators like they do across the other side of the fence with the non-war gamers. Some companies never send out stuff because they've got their name to sell their games. They don't need us YouTube creators or them YouTube creators. But I think war game uh, producers need to use their YouTube creators a bit more. And if they've got a new game out, they should contact somebody that they like and say, we've got a new game coming out. Can we send you a copy? Can you do a playthrough? Can you do this? Can you do that? And do a detailed thing on it. Uh, they're not. I don't think they're utilising them as uh, YouTube creators. That is, as much as they they should, and, and as they do across the side. Look at Ricky Royal. He started oh, doing war games. Don't do them anymore because right. he's, oh, he's got God knows how many tens of thousands of subscribers. He doesn't do war and he, games. And he's, yeah, and he's another guy that's really good at what yeah. he does. Yeah. And he gets people coming, can you do my game? Can you do my... And he can pick and choose and do good playthroughs mm -hmm. and detail. Well, I mean, that, that's, that brings the question then. Is it up to whose responsibility? It shouldn't be up to the YouTube community to do this, right? In my view. Is it the manufacturer? Is it the designer? Who, who should be responsible to try and get as much information and teach people as out there as possible i mean who well look i i think generally it should be the publisher i mean i could ask uh, you know other than yourself i could say hey mo can you do a turn by turn play of uh most fearful sacrifice or something like that and you know he would probably do it but i think generally it should be the publisher that does it i mean look at look at now the, the latest videos that showed up all over the place is Descent, the new Descent, right? Yeah. And right. Now, all of a sudden, there's like 10, yeah. 10 people with videos of Descent. And that's because, uh, um, what are these, Fantasy Flight sent them all copies to do this. So maybe a war game company should say, hey, these, these guys are all going to get a copy of this game ahead of time. And we're going to ask them to do a play-by-play -play video. The thing is, doing a good play by a good video teaching video is tough, especially for a war game, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, look, Ben needs three or four videos to go through Great War Commander, mm. which compared to some war games, Combat Commander and Great War are pretty pretty easy. Not easy, but I mean, they're accessible games compared to some of the others. So, I mean, I can't even imagine what a guy would do for like, Time of Trumpets or something like that. It would probably take forever. Or the next war series. I, I think it's just, I agree with you that, that videos would be the answer, but doing like a next war Taiwan video to teach every mechanic in that game would take forever. Don't you think? Mm. Well, but if you do a, a good playthrough and explain things, I don't do tutorials. Right. Because because I, we all me, we all mess up when we video. We can't help that. Right. It's just the nature of videoing. You, your mind's in, a, in a, you know many places. I do a playthrough, explain things as I see when I need to explain them, and people get a. I think most YouTubers do that, and people get a feel for the game, and see. Yeah, I like the look of this, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, um, even with Atlantic Chase, people have seen my videos and said. Yeah, love your enthusiasm, but it's not for me. And that's just as good because then I, they haven't wasted their money. They've seen how the game works. I, and I agree with you. They can make their choice. I think I think uh, uh, publishers should be aware that when you send, if, if they're going to do that, you know, rough, would you do a playthrough, uh, a, a play by blow by blow, 10 week course on this game? Most of us are going to say, I ain't got time. I'll do a I'll do a playthrough for you, and uh, you know, and people will get a good understanding of the game to see whether or not it's for them. But they don't do that. I think a lot of publishers don't do that. They don't realise that a lot of their games. And I get it on my comments. Oh, thanks, Ruff. I've just ordered the game, and I go, I hope you told them. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I agree, I agree with you. So what they you don't do? Realize how many sales they get through YouTube creators. Right, but what you do is 
you do a presentation of how the game plays it in the interests of making somebody interested enough to buy it, but it's not a tutorial per se. It's not a Ben Harsh, no. Right. And I, I agree with you because, as I told you before, you your video convinced me that I wanted to play that American Revolution tri-pack uh, from GMT. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm not Ben Harsh. Nobody can be Ben Harsh. The man, the man's bonkers. <laughs> right. But I guess my point is that doing a war game video series like that requires as much effort as Ben Harsh puts into, you know, it requires four videos and a big graphic content and all that. It's a lot of work. And it's also a lazy thing. You see, Ben's done Holland 44 and I've got that and I'm watching that. And I think I don't have to read the rules. Thank you, Ben. And, <laughs> right. Uh, it's um, yeah. I'm not a right, and, and that's the difference. The non-war game tutorials. I I've watched enough of them where I could grab the game and play it, based just on that video. And I yeah. think with mine you can't. Mine you'll go. Oh, I want to get that game, or no, it's not for me. Exactly. You right. The game, and then you've got to read yeah. the rules. And you've it's, it's a different service. It's a different service you're providing. Yeah, and it, they get yeah. an idea of the game. So when they read the right. rules, oh yeah, I remember him doing that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it, right, it, no, I understand. So as a designer, to answer uh, Kurt's, so as a designer, how do I make my game easier to digest? And as I was telling you before we got on, you know, one of the complaints that I get about my games are that I, I remember distinctly um, Tom Vassell saying this about in Magnificent Style is, well, it's such a simple game. Why does it need thirty pages of rules? <laughs> They're not 30 pages of the rules. It's, yeah. it's A, I tend to over-explain stuff, and that's to my fault, or I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's not. If it's and somebody I, like I tend to somebody throw in a lot of examples, right? And I do a lot of insert comments about rules. So that adds to the length, but it doesn't add to the rule weight. And, and one of the main things I would do as a designer, and I'm sure – if uh, Mike Butterjello's on here, you know, or, or out, you know, designers. <laughs> oh, Where's Butterjello? I haven't seen him for a couple <laughs> weeks. But what I do at the end of all my rule books, or I try to do at the end of all my, is put a comprehensive example of play where you take everything you just read and stick it into either a full turn or, a, depending on the length of the game, a couple of full turns where you. Now, as a designer, what I can do that you can't do, Dean, when you do a playthrough is I can. I can mold the example of play to hit certain points that I want to emphasize, right? So when I'm designing a comprehensive example of play, I can make sure, well, I think this is a little shady, so I'm going to make sure people understand it by making this happen. Whereas when you're playing a game, it might not happen, right? You're right. just playing the game. Right. So right. when I do my comprehensive example of play, if I know a certain, based on like, on the feedback, let's say from the GMT playtest crowd, if I know there's a certain area that I've explained, but maybe it's not sitting right with the playtesters, I'll try to go in there and insert something in the rules to, to emphasize it. And then when I do the comprehensive example of play, I'll make sure that shows up again in the comprehensive example of play. And so it's obvious that this is the way it's resolved. Okay. I mean, yeah, so as a designer, that's about as, have all these not as weird much as I can do. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, they have if these weird things play, happen. If an example of play shows you everything that could happen that probably won't. See, I did that exact same thing with the dark yeah, side. You, you can go I went into up. their comprehensive play, and I fouled there, and I recorded it, and I did a couple episodes of it uh, as best as I could, following along with in here. But my the way I did it, and and you know, trying to teach and learn the game through just reading along with their comprehensive play of example is not going to really help a lot of people out there. Right. Mm -hmm. It's just me kind of learning. And as I'm learning, I'm going to, I recorded it to help other people if they wanted to watch it and maybe learn something or whatever. Right. Well, good, and, good and GMT have someone that knows the game is proficient with the game record that for people out there. Well, and then have that poster online, which would have okay. What would happen? It would be a what I'm going to call a wave experience, right? So you have a a person out there that does this, teaches it, which means more people are going to put this on their table and record it, which means there's going to be more people watching you 
play it and get interested in buying it. So you create this wave of excitement for this game, but they don't do it. They don't. Lock and load do it. They've got Gimpy. They use Gimpy. Yeah, Gimpy does all their playthroughs. He's done it for their new one that's coming out uh, on Kickstarter late this uh, few days' time. Yeah, if if some, if there's publishers went, we like your videos. Whoever it is, we like your videos. Would you please do us uh, a playthrough? proper playthrough explaining all the rules we'll send you the game before it's released blah 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 i dare say um most youtubers who have approached that way would go yeah i'll learn the game for mm -hmm. them because also if you do a good job they may go we like what you did can you do it for the next 10 we'll just keep sending you games and yeah. but you know you've got to learn them that's the problem. When you send some people, I don't know the players. They must get sent sort of cartloads of games. You can't learn all the games you get sent if you're that big and right. popular. You right. can't. You've got to say no, I suppose, at some point. But us, a, a smaller, you know, a, a smaller sort of uh, content creators. If if GMT said, "Oh, rough. I liked uh, what you did on blah blah blah." Could you do a playthrough of this? We'll send you the game. It's not released for another couple of months. So you've got a bit of time to learn it. Could you do that and put them up and, uh, you know, see how we go from there? Mm -hmm. And as, as, as Jester said, if you put that up before it's released and you do a good, you know, you do a, a fair job and people are liking it and watching it, when that is released, they're going to go bonkers for it. If they, if it's, it's not going to be everybody's cup of tea. This is the other thing people don't get. Not everybody loves everything except me. So um, when it comes out, that's going to push the sales forward. And they don't realize, even when they don't do it, how many sales they get from YouTube creators doing just even unboxings and playthroughs. They don't realize, I don't think, uh, that untapped. Well, that untapped you might be right about that. I, I don't know. Um, it's an interesting idea. I mean, I could certainly bring that up, let's say, for example, for GMT, you know, I could ask them, yeah, could you have somebody do a playthrough of the Plum Island Horror live, you know, a tutorial at least? Yeah. If you go somebody said, look, we're, like, we're going to release this, and you said to some, you know, to Mo, we're going to send you this game. We'd like to do, could you do a, a sort of proper playthrough, you know, explaining things? We'll give it to you ahead of time. You know, you've got you've got a couple of months to, to learn it, you know, and you uh, know mm -hmm. it. Would you be interested? And I'd suppose they would be, unless they're very busy, you know, and most you'd say then I ain't got the time for that. Right. But are, I, I, are there are there podcasters who would do it for a free copy of the game or would they want to be paid? I, that I don't know. I was going to say, I, what's to prevent GMT from hiring somebody whose job is to record videos for these games? Or, as long as they can do it. Example, don't because I've it. seen I've seen company videos before, and they're they're not the best. Okay, um, so they hire somebody that's decent at it. Okay, yeah, right. they don't just hire some. You know, if they put a Add in the pain burn, they could well, find someone that I could don't do want this. To go, yeah, I don't want to go down the road a bit like the Dice Tower where they get paid promotions. Because right. if you get a paid promotion, you're not going to go, this is a load of old nonsense, are you? Okay. Yeah, you know, it's funny you should say that, Dean, because I lost huh? respect. I lost a lot of respect for the Dice Tower because all of a sudden they were being sponsored by Pandasaurus Games. And I'm going, wait, you're being sponsored by a game company and you're supposed to give me a a fair review uh, of games i mean come on yeah yeah that's why i don't do reviews i mean if 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 gmt said look we'll we'll pay you x amount can you do a paper i go no because you right. lose i think you'd lose respect yeah if they said look can we send you this game it's coming out in a couple of months would you do a playthrough mm -hmm. give people the idea before it comes out what it's like and they can make a choice you know i go yeah yeah give mm -hmm. me give me i, I, yeah. I think there is a golden opportunity. This is, uh, there's so many things game companies could be doing, should be doing. Like literally, we, I talked about this 10 times so far and our, they keep making counters the same way, 
but not one game company out there actually has produced a counter clipper. We're using some weird, it's not even for made for game counters. It is called a plastic corner trimmer. This is not a counter clipper. This is a plastic corner trimmer that they use to to round the corners of plastic objects. This isn't this isn't a counter. So if if game companies out there are like, oh yeah, we make counters. We don't make anything to clip them. Does that make sense to anybody out there besides me? Does anyone out there? Yeah, I can see your point. You see yeah. my point. You would think that game companies... If, if, if I'm a game company and I've got a game called the Plum Island Horror, right? I want to find somebody out there that does games in that genre, hook them up with Herman and say, get with Herman and he's going to teach you the game and then I want you to video it. And we can do this as he's developing it. And then when the game is on the line and getting shipped out... You send those videos out there and people can learn how to play. That means more people are actually going to play the game and record it online. And then other people are going to see that and go, oh, that's a cool game. I'm going to get it. There is no downside to this whatsoever. I don't see a downside. I, hmm. I don't either other than I don't know what the, you know, a lot – a lot of these companies don't work with a huge profit margin, so I don't know cost-wise. But if you do a Kickstarter, you're paying somebody to the video for the Kickstarter. Right. So you, you kind of already have that idea in mind as far as that goes. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, how much would you guys charge if somebody asked you to do that? Uh, Mo makes a good point, actually. Reviewing stuff. And you're you're being paid for that. I don't agree with way through is a service, not an option, so it yeah. should be compensated. Right, it's both yeah. a learning resource and a sale. I agree, Mo. Absolutely. And what, Mo, what would you charge? Let's say if uh, Worthington came up to you and said, you know, we have a new Pacific Band of Brothers. Can you do a tutorial of this? What would you ask them to do for you? I, I'm sure, like I'm sure, a copy of the game might not be enough, right? <laughs> to do a, a, a an involved video. Right. If you're, if you're I mean, off. Maybe it's value, you know. All right, there's easy games like D Day Dice, right? You you could teach that in maybe one video. There's right. complex games such as you know Time for Trumpets, which is going to take multiple videos, you know. And, right. and it, it, you know you're talking you know based upon how much effort it's going to take somebody to actually go through and edit and do everything they need to do and everything. But would somebody want to watch? 20 episodes <laughs> of Trumpets. I was just going to say the same thing. Yep. You can do it in two or three and get the main elements of the game in right. that and make it so a person has enough information to see whether or not that game is for him or her. That's it. Doing, if somebody said to me, can you do, can you, do you know, an extended playthrough and explanation of time for Trumpets, I'd go, that's a year out of my that's a year out of my my life you know yeah. um nobody would watch them i mean you right. find it even, even you do a great level. job and nobody would yeah, watch even them at, yeah. even at my level with with uh, the atlantic chase where i did all the tutorials and now i'm doing one of the scenarios you can see the numbers people who really want to watch it are still watching it but the numbers you know they start right. to drop down because people want to move on to to something else and so, by the end of the first video, they probably have a good idea if they want to try it out. Yeah. So they don't bother watching the rest. Yeah. Or then if they're really keen, they will just, yeah. or they like your videos or for whatever reason. So there's that to take into account. But I, it, I, I don't want to be paid for reviews because that's, right. that's down the road to yeah. shill. But as Mo says, if somebody says, I want you to do a playthrough for this and you think it's going to take, a, you've got to ask them and discuss with them, will people watch a 10-series mm -hmm. video on this game? Or would you rather be a shorter, you know, you've got to, I don't know. Pay, I don't know. I don't know. And, and basically that's the thinking. answer That's the answer to Jester's question is is really the, the problem is that war games are, by their nature, more complex than most non-war games. Generally, yes. And, you know, like even Ben Harsh won't go past, I think, four videos 
and he's doing medium complexity games for the most part. I haven't played the last hundred yards, but I assume it's a medium complexity game. But you yeah. can't do next war Taiwan probably. I mean, it's just not possible. Good, good grief! It, as most says, if if people realize, and I'm not we're not saying this because you know, oh, hold on, but the amount of time, unless you do live broadcasts, Jetta does live broadcasts, no editing. You do what you do, bang, done, fantastic. I can't. I do them. I can't really work like that. Um, and the editing takes an inordinate, inordinate an amount of time. Mo will back me up on this, you know, even if you're doing simple editing. Right. So as he says there, they'll go, why aren't your videos out yet? Because I'm the editing to make sure it's good enough for people to watch takes a tremendous amount of time. People don't realize mm -hmm. It, it's fine. We do it because I, I do it because I love it. You know, I'm not moaning about it. But if people, are, if, if publishers are queuing up with their games, or a publisher is queuing up with their games, there is no way you can do them justice to yourself mm -hmm. and to the company that uh, is, is, is you're <coughs> representing in a, in effect right. um, by just rushing the things out. I don't know how you guys do it because I I would be editing all the time because I'd be too I nervous. Know, I edit all be... the time. I right. edit all the yeah. time. I don't edit anything. <laughs> I know, and live, you know, yeah, yeah, easy, easy piece. But you know, my whole my whole th YouTube channel started eight, ten, twelve years ago when I was doing my ASL videos, my fifteen minute rules reference on ASL, which are my highest rated videos that I have on my channel, which are ten years old now. Wow! So. Um, there are people that will watch them. And I think how many, you know, it's it's kind of a two-edged sword, right? Because as Herman said, game companies, they don't have a lot of money. They're razor thin on their budgets and everything like that. They don't have money to blow like Fantasy Flight. We understand that, right? But the more that they can get out there and the more, I, there's a lot of games like that I would order if I knew how to play them, but I can't find a video online how to play. And I'm like, I'm not going to order it until I can, I know whether or not I'm going to play it. Or right. just see how it plays. If it's for your, if it's up, up. Right. Your so why, like I said, it's, it's kind of a two-edged sword, right? So there's no videos out there, which is preventing me from buying it. Cause I'm not going to waste money doing that. But if the game company would, <coughs> or, you know, if they paid somebody to do it or did it themselves or whatever, maybe they would get more sales. But if well, they get more actually, sales, like, then they got to pay this other person to produce the video. So it's kind of a two-edged sword. Now, I like your idea that maybe if the designer puts in a comprehensive example of play and then the company can say, could you just do the comprehensive example of play live, like on a, on a video? So that people can see the whole comprehensive example of playthrough. So it wouldn't be any work on your part other than recording yourself doing that example of play. And at least people can actively see it being played. I mean, I don't know. Is that you think that would help? Yeah. I mean, people like VUCA Simulations with their new game uh, Across the Bug River, they brought out their own videos, sort of showing you what was in the game and explaining mm -hmm. a bit. But of course, that they not a lot of people have seen it because they haven't got the punch of subscribers or the wherewithal of promoting mm -hmm. your videos. So they've tried it and GMT try it and, and they don't get a lot of hits because that, I don't know if somebody, if say the players, aid did, did it, they're going to get far more hits because they're the players aid. Yeah. Rather than a company doing it. Right. Unless the company has spent time and effort and money promoting their YouTube channel, right? And yeah, we all we all as as YouTube uh, uh, videoers, I assume we all do a little bit of that anyway to promote what we've done, so you can get the views in. Um, is it, it a case of just the war game game. crowd is not the kind of crowd that sits in front of YouTube watching play to? Playthrough video? I, I don't know. I, I, there's literally every month Fantasy Flight puts out a video for their upcoming Marvel yeah. Champion. And the, the, all they do is they introduce new cards coming out, like 10 new cards. 
Right. And they have literally, you can go and do a search on YouTube and there's like 50 people that do this and they mm -hmm. get hundreds of views on just a company introducing new cards. Right. How well, come uh, game companies or well, how can that not happen for us? Why are we? It's are probably, we it's probably a combination of war games are more complex. So nobody wants to sit through them. It's an older crowd. Maybe we don't want to sit through them because the crowd that goes to Fantasy Flight are a younger crowd, and that's just what they naturally do. Maybe maybe older guys like us don't naturally go to YouTube to learn games. We just sit there and struggle through the rule book. I don't know. Well, you, I don't know because you just said you went to Mark Herman's and you guys watch videos on how to play the game. Well, I do, but yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting point, Herman, because when you go on Facebook and they go, Oh, I'm trying to trying to find how to play this. Any ideas? And you know, there's 13 different videos on YouTube. <laughs> That's true. That's and true. Go, and you feel like going, look on bloody YouTube, but they don't right. because I think they are channeled into their Facebook page or yes, channeled yeah. into Comsim World or on BGG. They're all right. separate things, and never the twain shall meet. Whereas non-war games, they do everything. They Twitter, Twitter. They Instagram, they go on Facebook, they're on YouTube, and Fantasy Flight Games has God knows how many subscribers to its own channel. Right. And if you look at company channels in the war game industry, very, not, you know, compared to, you know... Um, right, and it, and it could be that we're deeply, in, we're more deeply embedded in the hobby, and maybe it's the casual war gamer who doesn't go to YouTube normally for this kind of stuff. Because he, Here's the thing. You could look and all these war games that are being released, there's like 50 people that have done a live unboxing of them, though. Yes. There's a million people doing live unboxings of Storm Above the Reich, but you can't find but one playthrough, one person that's doing a playthrough of it. That is that there's is no an tutorial issue. videos. There's no help for so I got the game. I want to learn how to play the game. I can't find anybody to teach me the goddamn game. Right. So my game is sitting there on the shelf. And the Mine's next time, the next time there. that um, their P500 comes up for the next one in the series, I'm not ordering it because I'm like, okay, I'm not playing the one I got. And it's just wasting. I'm assuming there's so many unboxing videos because they're popular. They are they are popular. They they I I love to watch them. A lot of people don't like unboxing. I, I love to games. watch them. I want to know what's in the box. I, I, yeah, I, but I mean, there's certain games you're going to order anyway. But on the yeah. ones that I'm on that I'm like this about, I want to see an unboxing. But I'll watch ten different unboxings because I love them. <coughs> and I right. do them because I love them. If I you know I would watch them. I'm not oh. everybody does. He loves the them. Is, Drinks. I'm above the line. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm out of bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not Storm saying above there's the a right. Hold on, hold on. Storm above the Reich. I'd love to do a playthrough, but I've got so many games that I need mm -hmm. to get through. I, I can't, I can't do. It, even though I'm not, you know, I'm a, a, a tutor, and because of the summer holidays, there's not a lot of it going on. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, Blue Tweezers. We haven't mentioned him, but he does a really good job with Ruff. He's top Ruff. Some games mm -hmm. out Come there, on. how to play them, and they go through and they play them. That series right there should get more. Right. Like a game company should GMT should contact Rough and Blue Tweezers and say, "We need to link your video to our game so people can see how to play it." Right. Things well, like Dean, that. Dean makes a good be, point. We are a cult of the new, so. And you know, also, it's, some some companies do that. I mean, uh, VUCA Simulations and. Uh, strategy Marta have linked my videos of playthroughs of their games on their website. Mm -hmm. so they, some do it. Some some do, it. and even GMT. GMT uh, does it. Has they even mentioned me on some of their games? You know, I think right. um, the the American Revolution one. They've said, "Oh, Rough Swordsman's video playthrough," right. and that's great. But they don't do it enough, and they don't work in partnership with YouTube creators. Enough, I think. I think a place. Uh, I think I heard uh, Compass Games. I think one of their streams. <clears throat> excuse me. That I watched. I think. Um, uh, what's the chap's name that owns it? Compass. Oh, uh, Bill Thomas. Bill. Bill. He was saying, "Yeah, we are realizing slowly and surely that YouTube creators mm -hmm. are 
there and they are helping ourselves so we need to sort of right you know they never used to send out um re uh, review copies but now they do because they right. realize but that, they're, pump they're pumping out so many games there's no way anybody could cover all those games i can't i, I can't you know yeah Mo, it's Mo's doing them. I'm doing them. Tweezers do. You know, it's, you can't keep up with it. We yeah. do what we can, but if a, a company specifically says, you know, whoever, would you do a thing like Gimpy? He's he's not employed, but he's the he's the man that does their their teachings, their their uh, boot camps, and uh, I think uh, a lot more companies need to do that. Yeah, the boot camp idea is a good idea. Yeah, the boot camp idea is a good idea. And I don't know, I don't know the the ins and outs of you know what what the uh, the arrangements are for that. Right, um, I was just going to say, who knows? Right, how much that costs, if anything. Uh, right, if anything, I don't know. But I don't know. Either. Yeah, pick somebody they like, and then they get associated with the company, and people expect to see boot camps or whatever you want to call them. So, uh, okay. So, sorry. Besides videos, because I don't want to spend the whole episode. No, 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 about no, no, no. There should be other ways for people to learn. Some people don't like to watch videos; they'll read the rule book. So, Herman, you had a thought about, or you talked about how you want to design your rule book for your upcoming game, the Plum Island mm -hmm. Horror. So, your thought is. Is your thought when you're creating the rule book to get the rules out there a certain way or to, how do I put it? Is it, is it to get the rules out there or is it to get a, how this, this is how the game plays rule book. Rule books tend, tend to analyze the rules, right? They're not, playbooks there's usually a difference right. between the rule book and the playbook so so how can we or you guys or game companies well, design things for us to make it easier okay all i can tell you is is how i do it. now one of the complaints i get as i said before one of the complaints i get about my rule books is that they're long for the complexity of the game so you know Sorry, it's a kind of can I yeah. just interject there because yeah. what you do is great because there are people like me reading it. You don't know the level of expertise or knowledge or experience that person's got when they open that thing. So you've got to cover all bases, and I appreciate that. Thank you. And I that's the assumption I make. I, I try to make the assumption that somebody's not played this game before. And that's because I got burned early on in my design career where I assumed, well, every war gamer knows this terminology and, and this way of doing things. So I never bothered explaining it. And then I learned, oh, that's a mistake. I have to assume that the person that's playing this game has never played one before. So you, you can look at it as though they've never played a game. Oh, they're an idiot. Right. And uh, <laughs> in a nice way. Well, I know what you're saying. Not so much idiot, but ignorant, let's say, of, of how to interpret this. So yeah. I'm always in that conundrum of people complain, oh, my, your, your rules are too long. And if I make them too short, then people say, well, that's not explained very well. Right? You're on BGG, aren't I? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I say... <laughs> Can you hear my dog? dog. Oh, yeah. dog. Yeah. dog. I'm not sure if it's yours or Ralph's. No, that's my dog barking. <laughs> no, mine's about that big. <laughs> yeah, I think he wants to play. I think that's the problem. Yeah, got the um, so I, I just I say, look, I'm just going to do it the way I do it. So I try to use the prototypical war game case system, right? Where are you going? But I try to interject narrative explanations besides that, okay? So you go case, 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 and then I have a little block, and then I just try to very casually or informally say an explanation of that, right, in, in, a, in, a, in real language, if you will, not, not legalese, right? You know, this mm -hmm. means that this, 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 and this is going to happen. So I try to sum up what, just, I, what I just said legally, and try to do it in a casual conversational style, narrative style, all right? So that tends to make the rules longer, right? 
because I'll try to do that. And then I'll probably put some kind of example at the end of each major section. So I can kind of sum up what I just told you. Mm -hmm. So that tends to make things longer and longer. Yeah, and then, yeah. like I said, at the end, I try to do a comprehensive example. Of, like I keep hitting my microphone. I'm sorry. I try to make a, a, larger, a larger example at the end where you try to wrap up everything and you try to hit the points that you think people might still be fuzzy on, which is guesswork a lot of times, depending on, you know, what kind of playtesting system you went through. So, you know, at that point, I just say, all right, uh, you know, if people are going to get scared away by a 40 page rule book, then I just have to accept that because I just happen to write a lot, you know. <laughs> We're used to forty plus page books though, aren't we rule books as as war gamers, are we not? And, and I have said this before, when there was a, a non war gamer channel, um it was actually Space Empires Four X. Mm -hmm. uh, he was he was uh, first his first sort of war game and he said, Oh, I'm interested in this. Oh, look at these tokens. They're quite small tokens for goodness sake, yeah. Counter. Mm -hmm. And he was and he said, Oh, <laughs> the rule book's twenty pages. <laughs> and yeah it, we're used to it aren't we? We, we you know yeah not only that but when i was designing plum island horror i had to keep reminding myself yeah war gamers are used to playing eight hour games if i'm trying to market this game to general gamers it's got to be two to three hours max max yeah right. and that and that is i think a lot of i don't know if a lot of war gamers realize but that you know, the general gaming market doesn't sit there for eight hours playing a game. They want to play, if, if they have an afternoon gaming session, they want to get three games in. To yeah. Get yeah. In, right? I'm quite happy to have an hour, two hour game of a, of a war game if I can, because I can get there, do it, and, you know, move on. If not, it's left on the table. You walk away, come back the next time, you know. Right. We're so used to it. Designing Plum Island Horror in particular, you know, you got to keep, I had to keep, coming up and for as a designer it's great because it makes you think more efficiently and cleverly so i'm trying to get processes down where i want them to accomplish a certain thing and i'm trying to get there the most economical way i can right and, yeah and the other way you know say that's better ways to learn war games jeremy white writes his war rule books very much in the euro style right and is that is that something that designers or developers, whoever, a change from the traditional two column, quite dense with the odd picky here and there? Yes. Whereas Jeremy White's is like, oh, bang, wallop, it's pictures and things everywhere. Very Euro, <laughs> yeah. very Euro type of game. If you if yeah. you play, you know, some of my my sort of non war games, they're all color. There's pictures, big font. Right. You know, and it, it depends for me, it depends on who the publisher is. For So for GMT, I still use that case system because that's the way GMT wants to do their rule books and they're, they're, they're selling it to a certain market that's used to that, right? Yeah. But Whereas if you, if you notice, like say with Crowbar, I use yeah. A, B, C. Yeah, brilliant. Right? Yeah. So I, I use a different type of mm -hmm. presentation. I don't do case 3.13A. You know, or ABC, right. you know, that kind of thing. So it all depends on who I think I'm, well, who the publisher is and who is the market, right, or who's the customer. Do, um, do people like GMT need maybe to reflect and review maybe the way they write their rule books, or is it too ingrained? The, the problem uh, is people playing war games are getting older. <laughs> They're not getting any younger. And we need influx, of course, like well, any. Well, GMT has, as opposed to uh, the only company that I've dealt with so far, GMT has a rule, has a, a structure for what, how to do the rule book. Like, you know, when do you use parentheses? When do you use bold? When do you use italicized? When do you use, uh, you know, quotation marks? It, it's it, how the case system works. It's a very structured thing. Yeah. I'm just worried about if somebody that never played a war game before watched the video and went, cool, that looks quite good, get it, and then open the book and it's like two columns. We're used to it. You oh. know. Well, if you watch any of the Dice Tower reviews, they immediately criticize anything that's quote-unquote a wall of text, right? 
Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons, by the way, that on a lot of my latest rule books, you'll see colored boxes, just anything to break. Right. Like in crowbar, you'll see pictures. I've been saying for years. Colored box, anything to break the wall of text. Yeah. So, and, and psychologically, has been stuck in the 70s to this day. They're, the last five years, things have started to change a little bit, but they still use the same format, the same way they do things from back in the 70s, thinking, oh, that's the way we did it back then. They have not evolved at all, or very slightly, in my opinion. Hmm. But, but, yeah. I mean, I'm just, I'm just thinking somebody new to the to the hobby, the war game hobby, gets a war game and looks, as the Dice Tower calls it, a wall of text, which you don't get with Euro games. It's very sparse, lots of pictures. Um, yeah, Euro games use most... Okay, they're simpler. They're simpler. I know there's a lot of rules to get. I, I realise that. Right. You can get the only way to do it. You can I get away know. with a narrative style of rules in a Euro... In, well, I don't want to say Euro game because... A non-war game, yeah. A non-war game, right? Because Euro game is a subsection of non-war games, but um, yeah, that you can get away with that more narrative style because exactly that because it, they tend to be easier to play, or a lot of the rules are hidden in cards or on charts, you know, things like that. Yeah, and you also what most says it's easier to look up rules if they're in case you know, and you can mm -hmm. index. Not everyone puts an index in, a comprehensive index. Yes, uh, I learned that the hard way too. Yep. Looking up and you think, oh, no, look that up, and it's not there. Right. Um, because it's a little weeny bit of a rule that they haven't mentioned in the index. I mean, the index indices would, would be wonderful. If you look up, yes. oh, look up this specific little bit, they wrote a couple of lines on it, and then what was it now? And it's in the index. Actually, that just came up on a most fearful sacrifice. The last thing I did was do an index for that, and that was a lot of work. <laughs> but yeah, it's valuable, and like you said, especially for a war game set of rules where you have lots of different little fiddly things that you need. Yeah, to you need to look them up. Where are they in the rule book? You know, um, right? Yeah, we're not going to have glossaries. I noticed that a lot of the non-war games that I've been buying re recently have got. Dedicated rule books that are nothing more than a glossary. So if you're looking up ability, you just look up ability and it tells you the information. That's a fantasy flight. And I like the way they, a lot of people complain about those rule books, but I love them because what them. fantasy flight does is it's a, it's a, it's a how to play book. So that's the basics you need to get into the game. And that book's what eight pages, maybe, right? This right. is how you play the game. Then they have a separate rules reference book that has all the details, you know, the weird cases or the super deep, and that's where you'll, like, like Jester said, that's where you look up that stuff. So you can get started in most of those games with eight pages of rules and get in but there. Again, they're not as complex as our lovely war games. That's the, see, it's a well, conundrum, isn't it? You know? Right, but I mean, there are some, like, you know, Arkham Horror card game has a lot of stuff in it. Yeah. Right, yeah. Jester, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, they that's, have that's a, get a lot of stuff. I've got it. The living card game one. They have a get started thing, and off you go. And then you go, oh, what's right. this mean? Oh, you look that up here. You right. Know, uh, and they like go. using they use keywords, which I think is a is a really cool thing. Keywords, right? So that word means the same thing wherever it's used, and it's very oh, specific yeah. use. So when they use it in a card, you know exactly what that card does. Right. But I mean, we have like. Uh, Let's just talk about the standard combat series, right? Eight pages of rules. I did a video series on how to play it. Mm -hmm. Again, not great, you know, just live. Here's how you play, going through the rules and just talking about yeah, it. Yeah. Somebody could do a professional job of that in a couple videos and turn out something that would really – be able to help players understand and play the stupid game. It's, mm -hmm. it's, I shouldn't have to create it. The only reason I did it was because there was no videos out there on how to play it. Right. And it's so not I'm a like, well, if I'm going to learn it, I'm going to just record it and maybe somebody else will learn it along the way. Right. And that's what we can ask. But they could funk. That's an introductory. It's a great introductory hex and counter war game. 
not everybody's cup of tea, you know, standard mm -hmm. combat series. But those rules could be funked up to appeal to new wargaming people. They go, oh, this looks cool. And they get the rules, and it's like, oh, yeah, okay. Do this, mm -hmm. do that. This is what happens here. Um, but then again, the, the company that produces that has set in their ways and have been since, uh, you know, ASL. So what do you do? There's no easy answer, you know. Um, there isn't. That's we, why we, we have these discussions. New people, younger people, uh, to play these quite, uh, I don't know, politically incorrect games, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> But we need to get across that it's it's not glorifying it. It's it's learning from it and um, learning the history, which again is all too easily forgotten as time goes on with the way the world goes. You and can try to change history as much as you want to. History is history. <laughs> uh, no, 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 the victor changes history, but <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> but, but yeah, even like SCS, which which Jester did, you know, he, uh, he did it. And and Chris keeps moaning at me to do Africa. I've got the first uh, edition of uh, SCS Africa. Uh, well, but if they if they up if they sort of funked up those you know those rules, so somebody got you know people saying yes, SCS is a great introductory to uh, hex encounter war games if you want to try them. Get this one, get SCS, you know, and um, look at the raw. Oh, yeah, eight pages of, or maybe 12 pages now because mm -hmm. they've got big color pictures and big fonts and made it a bit more reader friendly for somebody new to the hobby. Right. I think Mo, Mo just mentioned the game that exactly was the, the game I was going to oh, mention. Dear oh, Lord, I love it. I so, love it. Right. Warfighter. Down the bottom there, I think. Yeah. Warfighter. Um, is I was just going to mention it to you was an effort to do a narrative style that failed miserably. Yeah. I love, I mean, as you know, I love the game as well. But if you try to find out how to do anything in that game, it takes you forever. Yeah. You got to go through the whole thing. Yeah, the, no, rules, the, rules, the rules buried under a picture somewhere. You know, well, it's it's there when it should be there. You know, <laughs> exactly. So there's an example of somebody trying to do it differently and it doesn't work for a war game, right? The problem is, I think, with that game is when it came out, you had the rule book. And then they started putting this in, and this in, and different. You know, you had Warfighter yeah. Modern and the World War Two, So they had to cram that in. And they've what they've and that's gone on with all the, right. all the ad things they've done. I think and, they should and, add just the bizarre thing them. about that, it's such an easy game. It yeah, really is an easy game. But it's not easy to yeah. learn. We right. get these comments every episode where people try a game and they couldn't understand how to play it, and they so they got rid of it. And that happens constantly. Every week we get these people that go in, oh, yeah, I bought this game and tried it, couldn't figure out how to play it, and boxed it up and throw, threw it, you know, sold it or whatever. Right. And it shouldn't have to be that way. And I bought another Flying Frog game or bought another, you know, Blah, blah, and blah. I think that's why, you know, people can go, oh, well, I'll stop playing war games and I'll go and play something else. Right. And then other genres are more popular that way. We right. need to start switching it over. And it takes the responsibility of the game companies, the game designers, and, you know, everyone out there that can help support the you know, the hobby right. and, and try to and do you're, the best. You're talking before. about accessibility of these games, right? So we want people to play these games and we want them to play it often, right? Not mm -hmm. once a year. Right, right. So, and yeah, I mean, that's definitely, like, that's yeah, a, definitely a, right. It's definitely a challenge for the new war games. And I mean, I, 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 I'm aware of it. Now, whether, you know, I can pull, pull it off or anybody or Greg Smith or any of these other guys, David Thompson. Somebody, you know, somebody will say, "Oh, get me Battle of the Bulge game out once a year. It's that time. It's the anniversary, and I'll play it." And you go, "What? No." Whereas I'll, you know, start, you know, uh, Crowbar or any of Greg's games, you'll play them over and over again, you know, because they're easy to set up, they're easy to understand. Right. You and know, I want people to get the games. I want them to get my games to the table and play them. I don't want them to talk about them in theory. Sure, <laughs> but, you know, get right. them out once a year. You want to have <laughs> right. people playing them 
recording showing people them so that they go oh this is cool they go and buy it and then there's a big chain of event that goes um, my my most popular video is the hunters mm -hmm. it's got getting on for ten thousand views it's only been out a couple of year and a year yeah a couple year and a half because it's a game that they can go oh, i like that yeah i'll get that and people said yeah i've just bought though i've just bought the whole lot of greg's games you know and same with crowbar right. Fantastic, you know. Oh, yeah, this looks fantastic. The only thing for me as a as a YouTuber with that game, Herman, is the ups, is the back to front bloody map. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> you can but, blame Mark for that. He wants to do everything. Go big or go home, as uh, Moses. Oh, it's the wrong way. It's like that. <laughs> yeah, but a great game. Yeah, and but that is that is the challenge of the day is to make war games more accessible. I mean, there's obviously a huge customer base of new game board gamers out there. So how do the war gamers get them? Yeah. And, you know, I mean, obviously guys like David Thompson have figured that out because, I mean, Undaunted Normandy and Undaunted Africa and all his games. So so my point is that it is possible. You yeah. can get that crowd playing war games. It's how do you do it? And yes. how do you I, I, I said earlier that the war gaming has been stuck in the 70s. Yes. In the last five years, we can see there's been a change where now game companies are developing solo modules for a lot of their games, which brings right. a lot of people in. They're actually creating better components now than in the past. Much, much better components. When I can take a game and punch the counters out, which are already pre-rounded, and I just punch them out, it reminds me of a Euro game. Mm -hmm. I don't have to clip counters when I play a Euro game at all. Well, one more game. I mean, I get that with, with Shadows of Brimstone and um, uh, Folklore. Bang, 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 bang. Right. right. And so and, I, see, I, see, like, I see some bang. advances in wargaming. We just need to keep advancing forward, doing better and better and better, and maybe more people will come over to the dark side. And I think one of the things I and like for GMT, I think one of the reasons they're willing to do a game like Plum Island Horror is as a gateway game. Like if you can get a non-war gamer to play Plum Island Horror, then because it's more of a family or friends type of game, general yeah. game, then they maybe might look at other GMT games and go, Well, boy, you know, Hunters looks kind of interesting, or this looks kind of interesting, or No Retreat looks interesting. So maybe they'll eventually come around to that idea. Right. But that's again why I've done not a war game Wednesday, you know. Right. It, it's just and I post it on on if I'm doing folklore or shadows of brimstone or whatever, I'll post it on their Facebook pages saying it's not a war game Wednesday. They go, oh it's a war game. But they'll come and look mm -hmm. and I'm hoping I'm hoping that one or two of them will go, What else have you what else have you done? Well that looks in hunters look, or oh, crowbar. Oh that looks fun. Yeah, so that's what that's why I'm doing it, trying to do my little bit to uh, even though I enjoy the games, I haven't had a chance to do any playthroughs yet because of these blooming war games. But anyway, you know, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, that holy magnificent style system I first designed as a, as a gateway war game, right? Because it was push your luck, and that's kind of not a war game concept, right? Oh, the thing is, with your push your luck mechanic is you push your bloody <laughs> luck don't you you don't go no, <laughs> no, but the idea is that, you know it drags people into that so if they're playing that and you go oh Pickett's charge gettysburg oh maybe i should try another game about gettysburg right or, or right. maybe right. it'll drag people into this end of the hobby i mean we definitely need more people in this hobby what you need is, is people who don't play war games get into watching something you know like say for instance one of my not a war game wednesday and then going oh that looks interesting Right, and then, and then getting dragged in, and they go up the scale, you know, right. and uh, eventually they're playing um, uh, great, great campaigns of the American Civil War, you know. Right, right? exactly. Right, that's my well, hope. The, the only other issue, well, not the only other, but one of the other issues that I find tends to happen in war gaming more than non war gaming is they don't produce a lot of copies of the game. So if you're late to the party, you don't, oh, you know, this game looks really cool. 
I'm going to go buy it and you can't find it anywhere. Like the game that Ruff's got there. Like, oh, people are on all like, hey, that looks pretty cool. Let me try it. And then they can't buy it because the manufacturer only produced a thousand copies of it. And it's gone. Mm. I'm hoping that because I get it all the time. Oh, it looks great, Ruff, but I can't find it anywhere. Yeah, it's sold out completely. I'm just hoping that if enough people then go to GMT, oh, by the way, can you can you reprint? Can you reprint? They're going to go, oh, we better reprint that. That's what I'm hoping. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I get it I, all the time, yeah. Or I managed to get the last copy in the shop, and it's brilliant, you know. So they need to be aware, and that's why they should work in cohorts with, uh, you know, with, with YouTubers because we know what's going on. We, we get the feedback from from the you know the players um and you know we all encourage comments and things and i get it you know this is not big well tell them tell them right. that you want the game you know um but they don't seem to work together and uh i think they should don't you yeah, yeah. I, I i think it's possible and I mean, you're me. right. Maybe it has to come from the designers. Maybe I have to. Maybe I have to say something, or Mike has to say, or Greg has to say something, or David has to say something, and and to the it's public and work. say, hey. you've spent four years designing this game, and now you've got to do this extra work." I know. I, I can. I'm being. I mean, it. you could actually yeah. see. I know that when we introduced Plum Island, Highland, uh, Plum Island, a couple episodes ago. Like all of a sudden, the GMT uh, pre-orders went up like pretty high, mm-hmm. and then they kind of leveled off for a little while. And then you did a live show with somebody else, and then they went <laughs> up again. Yeah. And then you did a live show with somebody else, and then they right. went up again. And it seems right. like and then, when, and when GMT and does when their see, when they do their monthly update, it it kicks up a lot. Right. Right, and because, because I guess because people read the update, and then they start poking around, and then if GMT like Compass do live streams. People can ask questions, and and that wouldn't that be even better? They don't do anything like that, do they? Uh, not that I'm aware of. No, yeah. no, I think Compass uh, are the only company that do these regular live streams, telling you what's going on. You know, they say hi to right. the people, chat and welcome them in to get the questions. They pop them up and Bill answers them or, or, or whatever. Nobody yeah, as far as I know, they're the only ones that do it. Yeah. Nobody else does it. Uh, lock and load does. Lock and load does. Uh, oh, lock and load. Sorry, yes. Yeah. About once a month, they usually yeah, get yeah, together. Lock and load do, it, of course. do like yeah. an updated video and stuff. Apart from them too, then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that yeah, is another yeah. avenue that game companies, um, you know, Word of mouth gets out, people viewing, seeing what's going on, giving them updates are important to people. People need that reassurance. People need to hear what's going on. I know when uh, their uh, lock and load orders were coming in, David did a live stream showing everyone, telling them every week, this is where the boat is at. This is why you don't have your game yet. The boat is in the freaking middle of the Pacific Ocean. Once it gets to California, then we can get them shipped. You know, he's telling people. So, right. And I think that was great for a lot of their customers. A lot of people, I know when I order my games now, I think about the companies I'm ordering them from, and I won't order from certain companies out there. If they tell you that it's delayed and they're telling you and they're genuine and it's like, you know, you go, fair enough. You right. just need exactly. to Exactly. And exactly. Oh, one thing. You're not we, trying yeah. to hide it. You're trying to no. tell them the truth, right? If you inform your customers, they're happy. Even if mm-hmm. it's bad news, they know what's going on. It's when they don't know, they get the ump. And right. the other thing you haven't said, we all we were going to say, is smash that like button. Smash it now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, we're going to call this an episode. We're going to get offline here. We do appreciate everyone coming out tonight to talk with us. Ruff, what's coming up on your channel this week? Anything important? I have a guess. Most selling his copy, but I'm doing my – I've got my first part of my scenario of uh, Atlantic Chase coming out next week. Hopefully it's all right. Uh, maybe even the second part. The second pass got a battle with the Grush B in it, so nice. uh, let's see what's going on there. Um, and then after that, I think we're going to do uh, 
I'm dying to have a go at across uh, crossing the, the Bug you know, River, um, having enjoyed Arken. So, uh, and then after that, a bit of um, Stratagemata and then some Nations at War. So wow. much. So much. Very cool. Herman, what's on your plate for this week? Anything? Well, I'm finishing up my third article for the Inside GMT blog. So I'm doing articles explaining different aspects of the game. I, uh, David Spangler, I don't know if anybody knows who that is, but he's doing a fictional piece on the Plum Island Horror. So I have asked, he's a great fiction writer. Uh, he's, he's had a couple published books, and he's going to do a little story of Excellent. things that happened on Plum Island. Uh, uh, very entertaining uh, stuff. Lock and Load did that with their World at War. They had a series of novels built around Right, kind of like that. Brilliant. So we're going to put that in there. Um, I'm working on, I have an, a, game, a science fiction cooperative war game coming out from Nuts Publishing that we're working on. Uh, I'm finishing Miracle at Dunkirk. I just submitted uh, Death by Flags and Trumpets to Worthington. Then I have to work on the next game after In Magnificent Style, which will be called The Queen's Wrath. It'll be a fantasy version of it In Magnificent Style. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, the next crowbar will probably be on the Muse Argonne Offensive called Pershing's Crusaders. Uh, boy, am I forgetting something? Uh, Koenigsgratz for GMT eventually, which will be using the At Any Cost system. Oh, and next year will be Stones River for Revolution Games, which will be Blind Swords re uh, Regimental scale again. You don't mind pushing your stuff about? You're a bit of a bit of a you know. Oh my gosh, he's yeah. a know it all. You he? asked me. Wow. Wow. I tell you what, what we were talking about. Get Mark with nuts. If it's a solo friendly game, is it? Tell Mark to get his uh, fulfiller over here. Send me okay. a copy. And I'll do a playthrough. Awesome. <laughs> That's so you do tomorrow, guys, 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You're going to head over to the Boo Tweezers. We're going to continue our four YouTubers of the apocalypse. And yeah, see four old Tony. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, we're going to find out how bad it's going to get. We just landed and just got our units out there, and it, <laughs> it doesn't good look luck. good. Good luck. Yeah. Right. yeah. And they were firing yeah. into the blooming helicopter, weren't they? That's where um, Tony got uh, done. Yeah. So hopefully we'll see you guys tomorrow at the Boo Tweezers channel. And then we'll be back next week with the same time, same channel next week with another special guest. Hopefully Tony might be back. Maybe not. We'll see. Fields of Fire. Fields. Sorry, Mo asked what we're playing. Fields of Fire. Oh, Fields of Fire. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Vietnam. Vietnam scenario. Thank you, everybody. Well, thank you, Mr. Herman Lutman. My pleasure. Thank you. thank you. Thank you, my Good darling. Time. We do appreciate thank it you. very much, and we love to have you on. And uh, thanks, everyone, for coming out. You guys were great today, as usual. So thank you. We'll see everyone next week. Until then, take care, guys. Thank you.